Ladies and gentlemen, the session will start shortly. Please kindly take your seats and turn your mobile phone on silent or vibrate mode. Please wear face masks and maintain social distancing. Thank you for your cooperation. Distinguished guests, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the fifth WLA Forum, the WLA Laboratory Series, Precision Medicine in Multi-Omics Area. I'm Dr. Mei Tian, a physician scientist. My uh, expertise is nuclear medicine and molecular imaging, especially for PET imaging, positron emission tomography. Currently, I'm working at the Institute of Human Phenome, Fudan University. I will be your host today for this forum. We all know the integrated data analysis of genomics, phenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, glycomics, and other omics has become an important approach for scientists to explore and understand the complexity of life phenomenon and disease pathophysiology. This forum will bring together prestigious scientists and experts from around the world to discuss the latest development and innovative technologies in multi-omics uh, field. Topics also include the applications of multi-omics approach in precision medicine for mechanical study, biomarkers, and the therapeutic targets. This forum is hosted by the World Laureate Association and the China Association for the Science and the Technology, co-hosted by WLA Laboratories, uh, Sequoia China Charity Foundation, Park Land Foundation, and special support from the International Human Phenome Institute, Shanghai. First, please allow me to introduce the guest of our forum, which consists of online and offline session. We are honored to have several prestigious scientists join the event. Professor Barry Marshall, 2005 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. Professor Dennis Lowe, 2022 LESC Debicki Clinical Medical Research Award Laureate. Professor Jeremy Nicholson, Fellow of Academy of Some Medical Sciences, Albert Einstein, Honorary Professor of Chinese Academy of Science, uh, Sciences. Professor Tian Qiang, uh, Founding Director, Systems Biology Institute, International Human Phenome Institutes. Professor Catherine Huang, Professor and Deputy Director, Department of Medical Research Center, Peking Union Medical uh, uni uh, College U uh, Hospital. At the conference site, we are honored to have here Professor Jing Li, member of the China Academy of Sciences, president of Fudan University. Professor Gao Qiang, distinguished professor, Changjiang Scholar Program of Qi and Chief Physician, Zhongshan Hospital affiliated to Fudan University. Professor Liu Haitao, Principal Investigator, School of System Biomedicine, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The forum consists of one themed section, which is divided into two parts. Part one will be the keynote speeches. Each individual speaker will give a 15 minute speech Part two is a panel discussion, an inspiring discussion by presenting questions to our panelists relevant to the session themes. Uh, let's start with the first part, the keynote speeches, 15 minutes presentations per each in invited speaker. Okay, we will uh, start today's forum with our first uh, keynote speaker, Professor Barry Marshall, 
Professor Marshall is the 2005 Nobel Laureate in Physiology of Medicine and Clinical Professor of University of Western Australia. The topic of the speech he's going to share is New Genomics and DNA Zoo, Powerful, Simple, and Fun. Let's welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Barry Marshall. I'm a, uh, from the University so of Western Australia. Brief lecture called New Genomics and the DNA Zoo. So I'm not a genomics expert, but I'll tell you about the history of my life as I've experienced genomics and some pretty exciting developments that I've seen in the last month or so. My title slide there you'll recognize uh, I took during a visit to the China National Gene Bank. And that's located in Da Peng near Shenzhen. I encourage you to all read all about it and perhaps participate in some of the activities that they have there. Um, you'll see here that uh, I'm affiliated as well as the University of Western Australia, but also with Shenzhen University where we have the Marshall Lab for Biomedical Engineering. And we started this up a couple of years ago, but I haven't been able to visit there very often because of lockdowns. But I hope that next year I'm going to be spending some time there and working on a few different ideas that we have related to Helicobacter, but quite a lot of other technologies as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. Here we are at the University of Western Australia, just to remind you where that is. Uh, and um, that's the campus. Um, it has a Shanghai Jiao Tong rating, usually between 88 and 100, so it's in the top 1% of universities worldwide. And I encourage you to visit the University of Western Australia and consider it if you're doing any high-level courses. A very high standard at the University of Western Australia, especially in the sciences, in the biomedical sciences. So that's why I'm back there instead of uh, staying overseas, where I originally did a lot of the work uh, for Helicobacter pylori. You'll see here a map showing Perth, Western Australia, Pretty easy to come to China from Perth. It's usually just an overnight flight, often leaving on su Sunday night and, and arriving in uh, China sometime on Monday. So very easy for me. And it's the same time zone as China, of course. So it's very easy for us to communicate and collaborate and travel back and forth. So please come to Perth, and I'll certainly be seeing you many times in China in the coming years. I have a vintage gadget collection, and this gadget here is the Altair. It's the computer that started Microsoft. It's Bill Gates' first portable computer. And he wrote BASIC after that and then started Microsoft. And I have one of those uh, in my collection. There, there is a picture. When he saw this kit on this magazine, Bill Gates and Paul Allen quit Harvard, then moved to Mexico and founded Microsoft the first PC. So that's my history of PCs going way back. Now what historic events triggered the technology revolution we see today? And I'll show you this one. It's Sputnik. So in 1957, nobody cared too much about technology. Everyone was taking it easy. And all of a sudden, the Russians put Sput Sputnik, the first satellite, uh, into orbit in 1957. And that made uh, the Americans get very nervous. They thought our, the technology was not good enough, so they put a lot of money then into all kinds of technology. Now, one of the technologies that came out of that very quickly was actually the very early internet, and we all benefit from that, benefit from that now. And of course, I might be coming to you through the internet if you're not seeing this lecture live. And here's a bit of background. So in 1947, Bardeen and Bratain and Shockley and no, uh, won the Nobel Prize then in 1956 for transistors. Noyce in Intel and Kilby had integrated circuits. Sanger did DNA sequencing in 1980. Uh, Venter, Craig Venter did shotgun assembly of DNA uh, in the 80s and 90s. So that was a big project. Then we had the Human Genome Project, costing originally about $3 billion. Uh, and then recently, uh, more recently, the Nobel in 2007 for giant magneto resistance, which enables us to all carry gigabytes of data just around in our pockets on a thumb drive. So that's all great stuff. And so uh, th this with uh, fancy imaging devices 
has really made this technology jump ahead in the last few years. Now the first international internet was actually a connection between USA and Norway. And so uh, in 1971, Norway became the first non-English speaking country on the net because the US needed to monitor the Norwegian seismic array to see if the Russians were letting off any underground nuclear testing. And so that was the reason that they connected up with Norway. And as a result of that, we pretty soon had global uh, network connections uh, through the original uh, type of network called the ARPANET. So the ARPANET had started in 1968 and really there were just four universities connected, three in California and I think one in uh, maybe Boston. And so that was the original ARPANET 1968 and allowed people to log into other computers. Uh, by 1977 you see the ARPANET was having probably a hundred or more nodes and was international. And because of that, people like me in Western Australia and Dr. Warren, who won the Nobel with me, were able to look at the world global literature through the network in our medical library and realise that we had made an important discovery. So we were both computer geeks and we could perform many literature searches on terminals and we rediscovered stomach bacteria because these bacteria had been seen before. Nobody thought they were very important. Uh, you know, they were even seen in China and uh, in Shanghai. Uh, Dr. Yao Shi and Dr. Xiao Shudong published some papers on bacteria in the stomach. And here you see the old helicobacter down there, human log and June. And that was in a Chinese uh, PhD project uh, in Shanghai. And so if only those doctors had the internet as we did a couple of years later, they probably would have discovered Helicobacter pylori and not me. So here's Helicobacter pylori. You can see it's a corkscrew. So the question I have is, how do you identify a new bacteria and prove that it's new as a new discovery? Well, the primitive way, and this has been going on for 100 years or more, we can look under the microscope. It's gram positive, so that means it's blue spots or gram negative, pink spots. Rods or cocci, it has flagella, it has spiral sh shapes. And I'm showing you this is what the bac bacteria in your mouth would look like if you just looked at some saliva. So the next thing we could do, we could do the G plus C content, because we didn't have, ge have genomics. So that would, would be measured by looking at the melting point of the DNA. So obviously rather primitive means of identifying the bacteria. And Carrie Mullis only invented the PCR in 1983. So it was one year after Dr. Warren and I did our original work that the PCR was discovered. So you can see why I wasn't taught anything about genomics when I was in university. So moving on from those primitive techniques to identify bacteria now, there's lots of different ways, usually the 16SR DNA gene trees, uh, such as described in this paper, and or we can more recently do sequence of conserved single copy proteins, and that was published very recently from Queensland, Australia. So these are great ways of organising bacterial taxonomy on the basis of their genomes. How do we use that information? Well, recently we've been looking at identifying helicobacter inside the stomach of people, and it's a very expensive process to put an endoscope down and look inside someone's stomach, $1,000 in the United States. So uh, what we've been doing is a string test, and so we can slide the string test into the stomach, pull it out, we can do a culture on it, and we can look at the genome of the helicobacter if we find it, and then we can predict which antibiotic to use on that patient. So you see after you swallow a piece of string, you have helicobacters all over it, you pull the string out and then the string contains the helicobacters and the DNA of the helicobacters. So pretty simple concept. So the timeline of DNA and genomics is shown very nicely at the National Gene Bank on the wall here behind the giant mammoth. And you can see there's uh, Watson and Crick, uh, 1953 and then going on to about 19. I guess 99 and the human genome up here. Down here is like Sanger sequencing 1977. A lot of advances that some of you will remember. 
Now, 1953, what was I doing? Well, here's a picture of me in 1953 sitting on the lip of a whale with my grandfather there. And that was that Carnarvon where there used to be a whaling station in Western Australia. So 1953 in April, you'll see that also Watson and Crick published the structure of DNA in Nature. And guess what? Four days later, IBM released the IBM 701 computer, which was really the only decent computer with a normal amount of memory. Actually, it, I think it had about 10K of memory, 10K of RAM, I recall. It took up a whole room. And guess what? It used to cost 5,800,000 RMB per year to rent this computer. So that was the beginning of computing power and uh, also the possibility then maybe that we could do genomics. So I measured it and I think my phone is one trillion times more powerful than that computer used to be. So you know about Moore's law and every 18 months the compute, every, I think every two years or so um, the top level computing power doubles and so this is Moore's law and it's taking right up to about year 2000 you can see the concentration of memories. So because memory was available you could see that we're going to be measuring uh, genomes and uh, analyzing them in RAM so we could actually do a lot more genomics. But the interesting thing that happened was that the DNA sequencing technologies improved. So there was Moore's law down there on the white line, but also smart sequencing technologies, parallel technologies, uh, and then things like the 454 machine, the Illumina, uh, PacBio, all kinds of new technologies that are available now. So I saw recently that the cost of a full human genome from Illumina is going to come down to about $200. So in my opinion, everyone on Earth should be getting their genome done if we've got enough um, computing power to analyze it. So I had my genome done about 10 years ago, so I know what it's got. Cost per genome also going down, as I said, $200. So we do have supercomputing and genomics in Australia, and here we uh, have a photograph of uh, a computer at the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre near Perth and another one there at Murdoch University near Perth. But I know the biggest sequencing facilities are all in China and here we are at Gene Mansion in Nanjing and having a look at so many sequencing, next generation sequencing machines there uh, to look at. So now, before I finish, I want to tell you what I've become excited about. This is called DNA Zoo. Uh, and it was twen DNA's 21st birthday, or at least the 21st birthday of the human genome. Uh, recently. And I want to tell you that a lot of this is public domain and you can find this genome assembly cookbook on the web and there's this uh, uh, collaboration going on throughout the world and I'll show you on this world map. Where is the world map? There it is. Uh, and you can actually scan this QR code and you'll be able to get that genome assembly kit cookbook there. But you can see uh, after starting at the uh, Aiden lab here in Baylor College of Medicine, uh, they've used all uh, public domain open source software and you can collaborate, do anything you want with that information and, co and contribute. Uh, they're very, very helpful to get everybody going. I noticed that, well, we've got had one in the uh, Perth, Western Australia for about three years now. And I know also there's a DNA zoo in China at Shanghai Tech University and I'll show you some information about that uh, at the end of this talk. You can follow up if you like. I can show you a couple of pictures there. Um, now, whenever you go somewhere you see different animals, different insects, different plants. You can actually grab one of these things, put it in your little process and 24 hours later you've got your own identification of the organism. If it's a new organism you'll know straight away you can sequence it. So you can sequence uh, I'll go back, lots of bats. Uh, you could, anything that's got DNA in it, you should be able to get some information out of. So here in Western Australia, you know, we sequence everything. So DNA so looks at Western Australian river dolphins. And, you know, in Western Australia, we have these unique black swans. So that's a weird question. So let's go and sequence them. When did they diverge from normal swans? Is a very interesting question for me. And again, uh, you can get all this information on the Genome Assembly Cookbook. Uh, it's recently had a cover in Science, which you can 
download probably and read this article about all the different uh, types of uh, genomes that you can easily sequence. One of the first and the, one of the most important ones was the mosquito that uh, transmits Zika virus, the Anopheles mosquito. So could this high c method revolutionize the study of the microbiome? I'm always interested in the microbiome. What non-cultural organisms are present? And people have done these kinds of studies and I'll just show you a picture there of a, well, leukemia cells, so you're getting this kind of assembly data. Um, but somebody looked at the microbiome of, this is phase genomics data actually, so you can look that up. Uh, but you'll see this information that if they looked at the microbiome of the cow's rumen, they discovered 900 uncultured organisms in this one sample. So this is the thing with microbiome, what else is in there besides the organism we can isolate and culture? So as I finish, I'll just point out once more, uh, there is a DNA zoo project at Shanghai Tech University. So there might, might be people in the audience today who can talk to you about that, show you some information. And they updated the musk deer genome assembly. So here's the normal draft assembly and you see they don't have a scaffold and there's spots all over the place, but just by running the 3C process, they can see how many chromosomes there are and which ones are likely to be next to each other, et cetera, when there's trans translocations, how is it different from other deer or even cows? So great kind of information coming out of those. I think this is unpublished, so you should be able to see an exciting publication soon. And I'll finish off there again with a nice uh, picture of my team visiting the Dapang China National Gene Bank where they have lots and lots of genomics. Actually, they have my DNA there in the gene bank, but I think they're not very interested in that, and I don't think it's actually been sequenced yet. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you for Professor Marshall's excellent speech. It's really powerful, simple, but full of fun. Uh, I think now let's move on to the second uh, uh, speech, Professor Jing Li. Uh, Professor Jin Li, please come to the stage to deliver his speech. Professor Jin is a member of Chinese Academy of Science. He's the president of Fudan University and co-founder of International Human Phenome Consortium. The topic of this speech he's going to share is towards the Human Phenome Atlas. Let's welcome. It's a great honor to be here and to share with you some of the things that we are working on, in particular, the Human Phenom Atlas. Dr. Marshall really gave us, how, uh, gave us a picture as to how powerful uh, genomics can be in providing the, the clues mostly to, uh, to the biomedical sciences. And uh, in the last 30 years or so, much of the advances in biomedical science is probably owing to the contribution of the genomics. But the problem is that most of the things that are easy to be interpreted is pretty much exhausted. Right now, if you look at the so-called genetic paradigm, has been uh, greatly challenged, largely due to the, something we call the missing heritability, that is, due to the complexity of the system or the phenotypes we are looking at, we probably uh, will find it harder and harder to build or to establish the relationship between the genotypes and the phenotypes. Now, the question is, is it possible that we could turn the table around by looking at the other side of the table, that is, phenotypes? So. We, in this case, we really believe that the phenomics or the, the study of, of many, many different phenotypes really could provide the opportunity for us to explore the relationship among the phenotypes, thereby providing uh, new and novel information that could not be really approached or uh, attained by looking at single phenotype alone. Now we are facing a very complex system of human body. Now the question is, from the phenomics approach, whether we could 
really build a network, a network of the phenotypes and try to understand how different phenotypes should be, uh, could be related to each other. Thereby, we could start from any phenotype using this network to explore the mechanism underlying different phenotypes and try, by trying to understand the relationship of the phenotypes. And that we call the human phenome atlas, very much like a navigation map that you usually use when you are driving, try to find your way around in the world. So this is uh, the framework of a human phenome atlas. There are multiple, uh, there are different, several different things that we really need to approach before we get things started. Of course, it has to be a very uh, international project because uh, we have the people from different parts of the world and uh, we are very similar, but yet we are different. So in this case, by taking advantage of the, the human populations from different parts of the world, we could try to explore as much as we could. So in this case, we need to establish phenotyping platforms to, to, to uh, that, uh, that, that will allow us to uh, type a large number of phenotypes under one roof, hopefully, and uh, SOP is definitely important if it's an international collaboration. So to make sure that the data could be comparable to each other from different laboratories, we do need the SOPs and the standards. And uh, in order to understand the relationship to, uh, between, the, uh, between different phenotypes, we want to make sure that uh, all those phenotypes are collected or will be collected in the uh, the same set of population or same set of individuals. So in this case, case we could establish the, uh, the correlations. And uh, to facilitate the data collection and analysis, we need to put together a data portal and a data sharing mechanism. And uh, finally, we could generate a human phenom, phenom atlas. So in order to demonstrate that we can really achieve the capability to do a large number of uh, phenotyping. Uh, in the, uh, three years ago, we made a lot of effort and investment and put together a deep phenotyping center or platforms. And uh, by looking at this uh, uh, slide, you could see that we established the pla phenotyping platforms for molecular phenotypes, cellular phenotypes, imaging phenotypes, and uh, also biological phenotypes. Overall, we finally achieved the capability of typing 24,000 phenotypes for each individual. So this, and they encompass 23 categories. And you can look at the right, uh, the right side of this slide, you could see those are the, the name of the categories. They really cover a lot of uh, 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 phenotypes in different. And quality control is, and the standardization is very important. So we, uh, Dr. Uh, Le Ming Su, Professor Le Ming Su uh, took the leadership uh, by uh, putting together MAQC Society, which is an interna international society to promote, to promote the quality controls for uh, various omics. And uh, in order to achieve the goals of uh, QC, you need the reference materials. So we develop uh, reference materials for DNA, RNA, proteins, and the metabolites, and this uh, reference materials, set of mat reference materials has been really used uh, widely, not only in China, but also in uh, Europe. And the SOP is another issue. And to make the data comparable, we uh, do need to put together SOPs. So by uh, working with uh, uh, several different laboratories in the, in the world, we now finally come up with the SOPs, and now they are in the process of being published for phenotyping. 
Now the core cohort is the key. So we need to recruit uh, a large number of volunteers. So this is how we, uh, uh, we, have, we have been doing. So, so far we have recruited over 4,000 volunteers and uh, by now over 1,000 individuals have been systematically phenotyped at least at the 24 uh, phenotypes, or 24,000 phenotypes. And uh, then this 1,000 volunteers went through a, a, a procedure to, do, uh, to finish all the ph uh, deep phenotyping. And uh, in order to, after we collect data, uh, in order to make those data meaningful, we also need to put together a standard for the data, which we usually call the common data element. So this is the, the human phenome network we have generated based on the pairwise uh, co uh, co uh, correlation or correlation between two phenotypes. So if you have 24,000 phenotypes from each individual, so uh, overall you could generate uh, uh, over 600 million comparisons or pairs, and in which, interestingly, we, uh, we found that over 1.5 million very strong associations or correlations that provide, which suggests that they, these phenotypes could be related or underlying uh, similar, uh, uh, went through a uh, similar a molecular, molecular mechanism. So this is the procedure or the overview of this uh, analysis. Now let's look at the data. First of all, we are very much interested in the diversity or the, the coefficient of variances of those uh, uh, phenotypes or the phenotype categories. And what's really interesting is that if you look at the diversity, the biological and mental category of phenotypes, are more diverse than the biochemical phenotypes, and in turn, more diverse than the physical categories. So in physical phenotypes, it's interesting that all those physical phenotypes seems to be, uh, show uh, less variations across individuals, but at the functional level, biological level, the diversity are much bigger or larger than we anticipate. So we established a phenotype network based on the correlation. So this is a network which we generated. And uh, of course, we need to develop a way to analyze those phenotypes. So we established, uh, we introduced this uh, OPU, OPM, o OPC system. So OPU meaning that's one phenotype. If two phenotypes are strongly correlated and uh, we merge them together. The OPM is a, uh, module, so we, uh, if uh, phenotypes show strong correlation and uh, forming a cluster, we pull them together. And the OPC basically is the cross-scale uh, correlation uh, to uh, build a larger community uh, of the phenotypes we call the OPC. And if you look at different categories of the phenotypes, they seem they form interesting networks, but very different from each other. And uh, then we look at uh, the micro relationship of the microphenotype with the macrophenotypes. The microphenotypes refers to the, the, uh, the measurement from the, uh, uh, from the proteomics, uh, metabolomics, et cetera, and the macrophenotypes based on the, the mostly the measurement of the, such as the physical, uh, uh, physical characteristics or physical phenotypes and so on. And uh, then we look at the different microphenotypes and uh, we found that the proteomics or proteome or the proteins is the top contributor to the topology of the phenotype network. So that means that they seems to, uh, the protein seems to get have a, a much stronger relationship with uh, our function. Now, we, since we already, already have the network, how are we going to turn that into the human phenome atlas? 
So we did a further analysis and found some of the things that are really interesting. So due to the time limit, I just share with you uh, a few examples. For instance, we observed that depression and the sleep disorders show highest correlation with the complement and the coagulation cascade. And we could also quantify the immune age, and we could pretty much classify the immune cell, uh, A, immune cell trajectories uh, during age, during aging, and the two periods that show the rapid change during your lifetime, one in late 30s and the other is around 60s. And also we could uh, uh, model the immune age uh, to quantify the, the uh, aging. And we also look at the, the network, the property of the network. We observe that increased entropy and decreased resilience during aging. And the network-based network model can predict the biological age more accurately. And we also observe extensive imaging-based crosstalk among the, the organs. It's heterogeneity, it's uh, uh, symmetry or asymmetry, and we also found that the uh, cells like TRAG, T cells, and TH cells seem to be the key mediator of the organ crosstalk. And we also uh, did a study on anthropo anthropological phenotypes, for instance, the fingerprints, and we identified gene uh, EVI1 could alter the dermatography in mice by modulating limbs rather than skin development. And we also use the metabolic, uh, metabolomics to, uh, to study whether we could uh, predict uh, dementia in old populations. And in order to really get the, uh, the, the analysis or data collection analysis going, we uh, made a huge investment on the data portal and the hu for human, hu uh, human Phenom Atlas. And we also put together a data cloud solution for global data sharing. Yeah. And uh, so the goals of the Human Phenome Project is start from Shanghai, and we hope that uh, in the near future it could become an international, uh, large uh, international project. I need uh, two more minutes. Uh, so what are we going to do next? And by analyzing the, the result we observed in Human Phenom Atlas, we, could, uh, we have raised a number of interesting questions, for instance, on aging. What are the, uh, the, phenot uh, what are the phenotypic changes and the significance of the organs during aging, et cetera? So in the next phase, we are going to upgrade the Phenom Atlas to 2.0, and we are going to put together a phenol bank. And for, in order to uh, achieve a better or upgrade a human phenom atlas, so moving to the next phase, we are going to broaden the range of the population and increasing the phenotypic dimension by, in, by increasing the number of phenotypes that we type and, and also do a follow-up study. And what's really important is to introduce or uh, to put together a phenol bank. So based on the standard and the SOPs, and we do need a global phenomic data management and a, a, analysis system, and we call that Phenol Bank. And of course, we would like to apply this uh, uh, phenomic analysis in disease, uh, disease study, and also we would like to really use the phenom-driven approach to, uh, to a translational medicine including the new phenotyping technologies, drug target discovery and the verification, and the health management. And uh, finally, coll international collaboration, collaboration is a must. We do need to build a scientific community. And I'm very pleased that uh, Jeremy Nicholson, Professor Jeremy Nicholson is with us in this uh, forum. And he probably could comment on that as well. So thank you very much for your attention.
Uh, thank you, Professor Jing. Uh, excellent speech. I think from, uh, human uh, from human genome to human phenome, uh, we will be able to learn more about our body function and the aging, etc. So thank you again for your uh, excellent speech. Next, let's welcome Professor Liu Haitao to the stage. Professor Liu Haitao is a principal investigator in School of System Biomedicine of Shanghai Jiao Tong University, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and Biology. The topic of speech he's going to share is functional metabolomics towards the interdisciplinary innovations of life and health sciences. Let's welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor and happy to be over here today. Uh, first, thank you very much, Professor Tian, for giving me a kind of introduction, as well as the organized committee and the chairman uh, provide me this great opportunity to share our ongoing uh, metabolomics innovation in the biomedical niche. Um, my uh, uh, team, based on the Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Shanghai Center for System Biomedicine. So two things uh, we will focus on. First things we will, uh, my group will focus on the innovation of uh, functional metabolomics technology. Uh, another, we will use this technology to address the key question in the disease niche uh, from the uh, disease diagnosis, uh, past genesis annotation, or even the drug treatment. So you can see, actually, we want to do the small molecule metabolism. So the main tool we use is uh, mass spec. So currently, we use uh, QTOL for untargeted metabolomic analysis. That kind of uh, discover a process to identify some functional metabolites. Uh, next, we will use the uh, untargeted metabolomics with a triple mass spectrometer to um, investigate the potential function and the mechanism, the functional metabolites in a specific biological process and events. So first question we will ask why we should do the functional metabolomics studies. So the key question we should uh, go over is uh, metabolism. What's the metabolism? Why the metabolism is quite important for the living organism from physiology to pathology? So you can see all here. We know that the central dogma uh, defines the working principle of the uh, cells uh, from the molecular interactions. That means the DNA uh, will uh, translate into the RNA, and the messenger RNA will further to uh, express the protein. Proteins at last to synthesize the small molecule metabolites. So those. Uh, Macromolecule and macromolecule work together, and going the very complex the interaction will define the atlas of the cell biochemistry. So if we can find a good way, can quantify, quantify those uh, molecule changes, actually we can easy to better understanding uh, those molecule change and lie in the specific biological process of the events. So what's a small molecule metabolize? What's a metabolism? You can see all here. Those metabolites, you can uh, simply understand the chemically diverse uh, small molecule metabolites always to so confer the diverse function. We know the, key, the first key molecule is glucose for the, all the living organisms. Glucose will produce the nuclear acid uh, throughout the PPP pathway. We know, uh, in addition, the uh, glycolysis and the T-cycle also help produce some uh, what we call it uh, branch amino acid. Those amino acid can synthesize the key proteins. So if uh, we switch to the T-C cycle um, uh, through the SQE, SQE switch to the synthesized uh, lipid, lipid further to synthesize the fatty acid. So anyway, those uh, uh, chemical diverse small molecule metabolites always render the uh, diverse biological functions. So currently, uh, we, have a very, uh, uh, we have basic knowledge about the number of uh, functional metabolites uh, in the living cell. Uh, it's al almost 100,000 over there. 
So those molecule, uh, those number, uh, big number of molecule metabolites over there. So what uh, functional metabolites can take over the role to support the disease progression or even the drug treatments? Uh, in my group, we more treating in the human health and the disease. So if we want to learn well what functional metabolites over there and what, how the functional metabolites uh, work for the disease uh, progression and uh, uh, respond to the drug treatment. First things we should uh, find a good way to searching for the functional metabolites. Uh, in my group, to this end, in my group, we developed the mass spec based, we call the functional metabolomics uh, method. This method actually can help us to uh, discover and identify three layer uh, functional metabolites. First, first, we call the phenotypic associated metabolites. Uh, this group of molecules can be used as a biomarker to support the clini clinical diagnosis of disease. Uh, the second layer molecule will cause a mechanism associated associate functional metabolites. If we can better understand the metabolic and biosynthetic uh, mechanism of, of those metabolites in a specific disease, uh, we can better understand the disease pathogenesis. So at last, the third layer molecules from the uh, natural world, from the microbe or even the Chinese medicine plant, small molecule, molecules. Those molecules have great potential to treat disease accordingly by biosynthetic operation of functional metabolites. So, If when we have this method in our hands, so what the core value we should follow up? First things, we identify those functional metabolites. Secondly, we should to better understanding the function of the functional metabolites in the disease progression and even the drug treatments. At the last, it's important things, we should find a good way to biosynthetic operate those uh, metabolites passively, then we can a blockage the biosynthetic pathway of those metabolites uh, leading to the treatment of the disease accordingly. So uh, in my group over past five years, uh, we focus on the cancer. We know the cancer is the main reason uh, disease-related dies. Almost one to six uh, cases uh, account for the uh, cancer uh, cause death. So, one cancer we call the pancreatic cancer, the key of the cancer. Uh, this one is really, really uh, a uh, challenge for the human uh, community. Uh, even uh, this, uh, this disease causes a lower uh, occurrence and a high mortality. But according to the report of NIH, uh, by um, 2030, uh, pancreatic cancer, the number of pancreatic cancer uh, will increase remarkable. Uh, it will uh, ranking uh, first or second the factor of uh, cancer uh, related deaths. So really, really uh, challenge for human community. Um, currently, uh, this one we can see no good drug to treatment, uh, no good biomarker for a good diagnosis. Um, to over this challenge, uh, in my opinion, whether we can to find a good way to overcome those challenges from metabolic perspective. Um, in my group, what we have done to overcome this challenge? First thing is method. We know that no good method, no good application follow up. So first thing we uh, develop the precision target metabolomics method. We call the functional metabolomics version 1.0. This one can cover uh, 300 important metabolites with very keen biological functions, can cover more than 100 keen metabolic pathway of the living organisms, as well as this uh, method can be used to explore the functional metabolism of uh, more than uh, 18 uh, biological metrics. So anyway, uh, this one help broad application to address the functional metabolism issues uh, 
based on the different living organisms. Next, we know that in the real world of living organism, the metabolism is not stomach, it's sterile and datomic. So to this end, we develop further a new functional metabolomics strategy as a spatial temporal operative real metabolomics. This method can achieve the dynamic capture and also the spatial uh, depicting and precision determination of a functional metabolites in different living organisms, uh, by which we can easy to find out the determined functional metabolites by uh, further we blockage the, the biosynthesis of determined um, biological metabolites, we can reverse the disease progression. Um, further, if we can um, find a good small molecule drugs or compounds to target blockage of the biosynthesis of functional metabolites, uh, we can further to develop new drugs to treat the disease accordingly. So if, if we have good method enhanced, so what specific case I, can, I, I want to show you. First, is, uh, first case I show you, uh, we use uh, this uh, functional metabolic method, we identify five metabolized biomarkers. We compare, we compose as a panel biomarkers, we find out this new panel biomarkers, the performance is much better than the conventional enzyme markers whatever the selectivity or specificity. So currently, we just try to collect more number of samples from different uh, location of the whole country. We do the cross-validation. Hopefully, someday, uh, uh, this uh, panel biomarker can translate to, into clinical use as a, a diagnostic case. Another big question is why why the pancreas cancer so so uh, tough, but we can't easily to um, early diagnose it? The reason is we we find out the pathogen is really really complex. So to this end, we try to from the liver uh, functional metabolism to better understanding the potential pathogenesis of pancreas cancer. In this case, we find uh, several key metabolites from uh, liver tissue that uh, can account for the progression of pancreas cancer. So in the future, we will target those uh, metabolites biosynthesis and the treat the pancreas cancer accordingly. In uh, that case, we know that we found that whatever the cancer uh, treatments all cause a very, very, very typical side effect on the gut system. So what strategy we can use to increase the drug efficiency and decrease the drug side effect on the gut system? Um, to this end, we use this uh, uh, functional metabolomic technology. We try to think for some bioactive compound from the Chinese medicine plant. Uh, we are lucky, we find two compounds uh, very famous, uh, Barbary and uh, DHM. These two compounds have very similar working principle against the, the gut system disorders, all to regulate the gut microbiome system. But the target difference, we, we find out uh, the uh, Barbary targeting the AHR single pathway to target the uh, phenol metabolites and DHM uh, has a similar function, but the, the targeting pathway is, is a DH THR similar pathway by targeting and building the uh, bio acid. So in the future, we are have a good uh, strategy to try to compile those natural products with the, the cancer drugs. Then we can realize the purpose to improve the uh, drug efficiency and decrease the side effect. Uh, due to time limitation, I just quickly use several slides. The last, thing, last case I want to show you, we know that the biofilm formation caused by the uh, kind of uh, the bioorganisms 
all account for the, the drug, uh, drug resistance. Uh, the biofilm almost uh, account for 80% uh, drug resistance in clinic, whatever the cancer treatments or the uh, vascular disease or even diabetes. So in my group, we use this strategy, find five functional metabolites. If we can block it, uh, those metabolized biosynthesis, we can uh, inhibit the biofilm formation. So, so it's to, to decrease the occurrence of uh, the drug resistance in clinic. Okay, so in the future, what we will do uh, on the functional metabolomics, uh, we try to uh, improve our strategy to change the phase of, of the functional metabolomics to facing the most challenge in biomedical niches. So further to innovate, uh, make great effort on the method development. Uh, one we call the one thousand cell metabolomics. This one allow us to rapidly um, discover and validate back, uh, back to compound from the uh, diverse natural product then we can find some lead compound for future drug discovery and development. Um, very, very important strategy, we will further to upgrade STOM as STOM Plus. This one uh, allow us to do single cell disease classification and diagnosis. We can do better the single cell disease pathogenesis annotation. Uh, hopefully we can target the single cell to develop the new drugs. Okay, so over the past three years, uh, we did a lot of great effort due to the size of the group is uh, limited, but we still have achieved some uh, a very, very fantastic outcome. So you can see all here. So also uh, many very key medium to highlight our metabolic discovery. Uh, we also to very actively to pass to share our uh, metabolic discovery on functional metabolism um, through the uh, various the famous institute or even the King Conference. Uh, also, we receive many honors and award uh, worldwide to recognize our contribution uh, for functional metabolomics towards the biomedical innovations. So at last, uh, I want to say, uh, functional metabolomics is the branch of uh, phenom uh, atlas. So we will uh, further do our great to improve the performance of a functional metabolomics strategy. Uh, hopefully more and more students and scholars can work together to innovate the future of a functional metabolomics then we can do great things in improving the population health and the disease prevention. Uh, at last, I would like to take this great opportunity, give my thanks to uh, organized committee and chairman, uh, my students, my col collaborator, or uh, even the funding agency. We know that no good money, no good story to tell. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Li, uh, for his inspiring speech. Now, next, let's welcome Professor Catherine Wang to deliver her speech online. Uh, professor Wang is a professor and deputy director of the Department of Medical Research Center, uh, Peking Uni, uh, Uni Medical College Hospital. The topic she is going to share is Frontiers on Mixed Technology Advances, the Development of bio Biological and Translational Medical Research. Let's welcome. Professor Tan for your kind introduction and thanks to the WLA to give me this opportunity. It's my great pleasure to share some of my proteomics and uh, translational work here in this forum and talking about, you know, the molecule in between the genome and the metabol uh, metabolome. So why we need to discuss 
or the multi-omics technology, because we do have that many type of molecules in our body. So we, that means we need to include, you know, the genomes of what may happen and the transcriptome, what is going to happen and the proteome, what is happening and why, and at the end, what has been done. So we know that human body is a dynamic system. And I think all molecules in our body determine the health status of the individuals. So we all are very familiar with the sequencing because um, the genomics and transcriptomics develop way quicker than the other two major omics uh, because the proteomics and metabolomics need to rely on a physical technology that is covered in the 19th centuries. Uh, it's called mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry basically is a measure. Uh, it measures the mass to charge ratio. And because it has a various mass analyzers, that's cause it's very higher technical barriers. So I was, I have been um, more than 20 years research experience in the mass spectrometry and MS-based proteomics. I was trained as a physical chemist in Hong Kong U, studied the fundamental mass spec and, you know, studied the formation of BNYIs. And I was, have been spent um, more than eight years in the Swiss Research Institute in Yates lab to study how to use this MS to work on proteomics. And now in China, I do a lot of uh, translational work. So in my lab, we basically cover all the proteomic related technology. You can uh, name it, for example, the uh, latest DIA quantitative method, post translational modification, protein glycosylation, and structural proteomics, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of that, we also develop our own single cell protein method. And we have a very strong data analysis team to do all the integration of our data and study the mechanistic. So um, in the first part, I will introduce some of those my work that use this uh, MS-based proteomic to really get the novel discovery in the basic biologies. For example, we have developed the targeted IP multiplex light absolute quantitative mass band method. It's called Team Lab. We use this absolute quant method to study the TCR-CD3 complex. Uh, we basically measure you know, 20 tyrosine phosphorylation, how the pattern they look like uh, based on different stimulation. And we discovered that CD3 epsilon has a very unique single phosphorylation pattern. And uh, within this pattern, we have several new functions to discover. The most important thing is that we use this new function to be able to construct a new type of CAR T and the CD3 epsilon CAR instead of the CD3 um, zeta CAR. So um, we basically advanced the new class of this uh, uh, CAR-T immunotherapy, and it's been published two years ago in the cell. And the second is we have been developed our own uh, home view ultra sensitive picoliter single cell chip device. Um, we use this device, our average single HeLa protein ID uh, in the quant matter is greater than 2,600 proteome. And the sensitivity reached to 0 0.1 centimole that close to single molecule level. So by far, it's still the top standard in the field of the single cell proteome uh, uh, research. And use this method, we were able to accurately identify the RNA binding protein targets of the ARGO2 knockout mouse oocyte. So we basically greatly complementing the important functional information that's not available of single cell transcriptome. And um, uh, during the COVID era, we also use this proteomics study a lot of COVID disease. Um, we have been um, identified two stage of the COVID-19 disease. Uh, basically, at the early stage, we found its immune suppression and the tight junction damage and large scale metabolism dysfunction. And we also work on uh, three cohorts that cover the asymptomatic all the way to 12 months covalescence. We still found that these uh, uh, patients remaining the immune suppression and also have consistent cholesterol metabolism and mild cardio function damage. 
And the most exciting thing is we were able to uh, map the most comprehensive profile of O-link and N-link glycosylation of spike protein, which purified directly from the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. From there, we discover a novel, very novel route of the protein glycosylation called O-follow N. And now back to our second part is the most exciting one. How can we do the biomarker-driven translational medicine? How to use the, our omics technology to achieve translational and precision medicine? Um, to figure out this, I actually asked myself four questions. Why are there dozens of published biomarkers that can't be translated? How can we get markers that can be validated and translated? And how can drug development be more effective? And how to make first-in-class medicine? So. To think about the answer of these questions, and for the first one, I think maybe it is because the targets are not right. I'm not saying that the targets are not told, uh, all the targets are not right, but they are not at least 100% right. And then for the three other questions, I think when we get the right targets, we probably will achieve all of them. So I think the very essential element of the, the biomarker-driven translational medicine is to find the right targets. And how to find the right targets? It's been, um, I think, about for many years. Uh, since 2015, I come up with this map map. So I think uh, we have to complete all the elements that to, uh, to achieve this goal. So firstly, we need to get the right questions. And second and third, we need to obtain the right data and use the right tools. And at the end, the most important thing is that we need to do a lot of functional validation and larger human cohort validation. So we hope that after these four steps, we can come up with new drug targets and new IVD targets. To at the end, we can really contribute the right protocol and guideline for our older physicians in the real world. So why we need to get the right questions? Because the right clinical question makes the right cohorts. It's not like we just get um, thousands or hundreds or even you know, 10, 100,000 samples from our minus 80, it works because it really doesn't serve any purpose at the end. And so I will make an example of one of my uh, successfully translated project to share this experience with you. So I start this um, collaboration with Professor Ning Li. Um, he's retired now already and from UN Hospital. He asked me the question, say, Kathy, can you discover the stage-specific biomarkers to reveal progression mechanism of hepatitis B liver disease? That's from uh, that's since 2015. And so he has, Professor Lee has already built up a very large cohort. They are well-designed, multi-dimensional, complete personal and environmental and medical information they are included. So they separate by the stratification guideline, they separate all the patients within eight groups um, about more than 100 samples per group. They are CHB group, fibrosis group, LC group, and HCC 1, 2, 3 group, and 1, 2, 3, 4 group, and we have uh, come out with the healthy control later on. So when we get when we have a high quality cohort, the next step I'll ask myself how to not waste it to those samples. Um, that means we need to obtain the right data. We need to obtain the no bias, highly equipped, validated data. So the unbiased highly QC data is very important. I probably spent more than four years to establish the whole QC SOP for data accuracy and reliability of the clinical sample because you know the mass spectrometer, they change every two years. <laughs> and so right now, we have the benchmark of the coverage and the depth of the plasma urea protein. Generally speaking, when average people, they can get 1,000 protein from plasma and 2,500 protein from urea. Now we can get in our lab, it's 1,500 to 3,000 and 6,000 in it from urea. The most important thing is we control our CV, uh, not like fulfill the publication level, that 30% is we control the CV in the real world for 15%. And we also hold the first position in the national proteomic contest. So the key is the very high quality data are the keys to the successful validation and translation. 
For example, um, in our COVID project, one of them, we only have about 15 patients from those um, hospitals in Wuhan. And then we, um, at the beginning, we, we analyzed them in a, in a one group. Then we found all of them have the green, you know, uh, in reduce the qu uh, quantity of the protein. And then when we separate by the reviewer request to take up uh, three cases of the severe patients at the end, we, have, we surprisingly found that they do have the immune activation at the, at the late stage. So that, that's caused us to figure out those two stage. Um, uh, the, the, that paper in the Nature Communication get a very high cited. And after that, when you get your marker uh, come out, we do need a lot of a technical validation. The first, the first thing is, of course, the PRM validation compared with your mass spec quantitation. And also, we use the PRM compare our ELISA validation. You can see that your data or your marker is accurate or not. The validation will speak and tell you. And so the last thing is that we need to use the right tools. For our liver uh, project, we do have the um, done the uh, DNA methylation and proteum quant and metabolome quant on the whole, the same patient cohort. And uh, we have the each protein, uh, which omics data, they are very great. So they, all of them, they can separate to publish on the paper. But still, I cannot answer uh, Professor Lee's question, can you find a state-specific biomarker for me? So then we, I was thinking how we can integrate all these different molecules together. So we use all type of bioinformatics, machine learning, deep learning, AI, and incorporate with biological, pathological, published database, et cetera, et cetera, and have a lot of uh, much more criteria. So we finally come out, I think I spent um, uh, four years to come up with the integrative multi omics modeling system. Using this system, we do we are able to integrate all different molecules uh, between the genome and the proteome and the metabolome. So using this system, we are happy to find that we indeed can discover and um, <clears throat> the stage specific marker group, for example, these are belongs to different uh, the classified group. And also we were able to see uh, part of the marker show that the progression of the CHB, they will move to fibrosis and LC and HCC1. So the, the last important part to find the right target is you do need to do a lot of validation that including biological and functional and large population. So we have done the, our uh, the, uh, cell system and the animal system. So we discover a bunch of multi-TAA uh, targets. We select one of them, it's called target S. We found that the target S has the um, expressed very well on the various tumor tissue. And based on that, we develop our own anti first in class anti target X ADC drug. So from our data, we can see that uh, because the target is so well, the um, the behavior of our anti-target XADC, it behaves so well. And the protein copy related to well with the cytotoxicity, that's the first one. And the second is the the um, ADC has achieved the complete remission in the tumor CDS model. Our ongoing toxicology also shows the great safety. This graph um, is compared our commercial drug that's anti-VEG um, F um, and this is our anti-target ADC. You can see at the same uh, concentration of the drug, then we have a way uh, greater performance. And in the future that we actually wanted to use our multi-omics technology to classify, you know, the, the tumor subtype and make them become target X positive, target B positive, et cetera, to achieve the precision medicine. Um, at least at the beginning. And there's another very exciting discovery for during this project. We found that um, within the traditional drug development pathway, when you get the different milestones, you spend a lot of years. For example, when you get to the PCC milestone, you probably will spend the three to five years. And then we, we just use less than a year to achieve the PCC milestone already. So that gives us a very high confidence that we were able to expect, expect expected that the drug development process from 10 to 17 years to three to five years. So based on this information, uh, we are able to start our own company called uh, in the last year, uh, July, 
Invest by Nespal, Sosco, etc., and it's called Fosin Biotech. Fosin Biotech basically discovered the true markers using multi omics enabling the first in class drug discovery. And our slogan is We innovate for patients. So that is the last slide. I will take this opportunity to thanks to all my teams and all my great collaborators and my funding source, that's SMFC, most administrator of the education. Um, my last slide would like to um, end up my talk, use this uh, the message that printing on the wall of Cleveland Clinic, it says the future belongs to those who seize the opportunities created by innovation. And thank you for your attention as well. Thank you, Kathy, for your uh, interesting topic and the excellent speech. And now let's move on to the next one. Let's welcome Professor Dennis Lowe online to share his speech with us. Uh, Professor Lowe is a 2022 Lascar Debate Clinical Medical Research Award Laureate. Uh, he's the Associate Dean in Research, Faculty of Medicine, Chair of Department of Chemical, uh, Chemical Pathology, Li Kaixin Professor of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. The topic is, uh, of the uh, speech he is going to share is circulating DNA coming in all sizes and forms. Uh, Professor Liu? So, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, like to thank the uh, forum for kindly inviting me to give me this chance of sharing some of my work with you. So I'd like to talk about the, some data on circulating DNA. So my primary areas of research is in prenatal testing, which is an established part of modern obstetrics care. But however, in many scenarios, the conventional invasive te uh, prenatal testing are invasive and use technologies such as amnus antesis in which a long needle is inserted in the uterus. And every time we do this, there's a risk that we might harm or even kill the baby. And because of this reason, uh, for many years, um, my group has been interested in the development of non-invasive prenatal testing. For example, we asked whether it's possible to take a blood sample of a mother and be able to tell something about the genome of the baby. So in 1997, uh, my group showed that uh, during pregnancy, uh, the fetus would release its DNA into the bloodstream of the mother. And then this DNA is present very early on from the seven weeks of pregnancy onwards. And after delivery is clear extremely quickly. Uh, so we wonder whether we can use this technology to do the prenatal testing of say chromosome abnormalities such as uh, Down syndrome or trisomy 21. So um, in 2008, we developed a method whereby we sequence millions of DNA molecules in plasma. And because we know um, that uh, the human genome sequence, we can map each of those sequences back to chromosome from which it comes from. And then the bottom here, we can basically plot the ratio of different chromosomes in the plasma. And interesting, by using this technology, we find that we're able to detect fetal Down syndrome with an accuracy over 99%. And because of this accuracy, the technology was uh, introduced in autumn 2011. And to date it's called NIPT or non-invasive prenatal testing. It's available in many countries and millions of tests were done every year. So for the last few years, we've been very interested in the biophysical characteristics of circulating DNA. And one of those characteristics is that of size. Now, for example, you can measure the size of circling DNA in a pregnant woman. This is what you get. So the x-axis is a size from 50 to 200 base pair. And the y-axis is the frequencies of those molecules. Now, one thing very interesting is that you can see that the field DNA molecules, which are in blue, are actually a little bit shorter than the uh, circling DNA from a mother, which is in red. Uh, so basically, one thing we can see is that if we have the whole genome together, then the, the DNA is probably like uh, two meters long. But you can see basically in the circulation in plasma, the DNA is extremely short. So there must be some sort of fragmentation process. And interesting, from the graph I showed you just now, you can basically use the fragment size as a type of biomarker. And more interestingly, when we look into detail, we also find that the uh, ends of these uh, fragments 
is also a type of um, bar markers, are called end motif markers. And furthermore, you can also use the fact whether the end is a, a blunt end or a jagged end, and yet another type of bar markers. And all of these bar markers is due to the interplay between a DNA and certain nucleases which are in our body. And the nuclease expressions are different in different disease conditions like uh, cancer and in physiological condition like pregnancy. So all of these biomarkers together now have a name, it's called fragmentomics. So basically the omics of the fragmentation of DNA. And recently we've been asking, okay, so this fragmentation pattern is of course generated by some technology, which in this case is a short rate sequencer, light from Illumina. And we wonder whether the fact that we use a short rate sequencer would somehow color or bias what we see. It's almost like if you wear a spectacles with different color glass and you look into the world, of course, the world will be colored indifferently. And so we wonder, is the use of short rate sequences somehow bias what we're seeing? And so we wonder what would happen if we sequence circling DNA with some of the more recent single molecule sequencer. For example, the one from Pacific Bioscience. Now in this type of technology, uh, for single molecule sequencing, there's no amplification step. Whereas in the second generation technology like Illumina, there is some sort of amplification step. Now, for example, when you do a direct back-to-back uh, -back comparison, if you use an Illumina sequencer, they can see that most of the serving DNA molecules is less than 200 base pair. There's very few molecules above that. And in any case, the limit of this type of sequencer is 600 base pair. But interestingly, when you use a Pacific Bioscience sequencer, then for the first time, you can see this population of circling DNA, which are extremely long. So I call them super long cell-free DNA. And also, if you look at pregnancy, you can see actually those uh, super long cell-free DNA are actually quite abundant. In the first trimester, the median is about 15% of those circling DNA molecules are long. And then if it's in the second trimester, it's up 20%. And the third parameter is 30 percent. And then also because they're so long, then they would actually contain more genetic information. And one of those genetic information is that of um, single nucleotide polymorphism, which we can use to differentiate the fetal and mother's DNA by looking, for example, at SNP allele, which the baby has inherited from the father and which are absent in the mother. Now we find, for example, using those super long DNA, for example, here I illustrate one, which is 16 kilobase. And because it's so long that one of these molecules basically contain multiple SNPs. Basically you can do a haplotype just on one molecule. But whereas in the old days when you're doing a short rate sequencer, then only every, one, every few molecules can you see one SNP. And to construct any sort of haplotype would be impossible unless you use some sort of a, deduction method. And this is another example when you see a super long maternal DNA in plasma of 24 kilobase. And once again, because of this length, one molecule, you can determine the whole haplotype. So apart from analyzing the genetics difference between mother and baby, you can also use those super long DNA to look at epigenetics. And epigenetics uh, is useful in this context because for example, in my body, there are billions of cells and they contain the same DNA sequences, but different tissue will have epigenetic profile, which are different. Now, previously, we have developed a technology called plasma DNA tissue mapping, in which we use a type of uh, DNA sequencing called bisulfide sequencing, and then we sequence the plasma, and then we compare that profile to the epigenetic profile of different organs in the body. And then by using a deconvolution algorithm, I can deduce what are the relative contribution of different tissue into a plasma. But the problem is that this bisulfide treatment is a rather harsh treatment process. And it would, for example, degrade a lot of the input DNA. There's some publications which said you could degrade, degrade maybe 90% of the DNA. And furthermore, because it's all harsh, then we wonder where there's any risk that it might even artificially shorten the originally long cell-free DNA. So we wonder, is it possible for us to develop 
a type of uh, a methylation aware sequencing method which does not require B sulfide conversion. So we wonder, is it possible that when we do, for example, single molecule sequencing like that from passive bioscience machine, whether the epigenetic profile is actually somehow already contained in the signal. Now, previously, um, Pacific Bioscience, uh, their group, they have also looked to see whether it's possible. But the data they've generated indicated that accuracy is only like 5%. But uh, we have decided to actually reopen and look into this, uh, this problem. Now, for example, when in the, uh, in the Pacific Bioscience method, you have a DNA polymerase, which is copying your target DNA. And depends on the which base is being incorporated, you emit an optical signal. And then different bases are indicated by different colors. So you can see the pulses of this of uh, a signal. And then you can measure a variety of things. You can, for example, look at the time duration between different signal called the interpulse duration. You can actually measure the duration of the pulse itself called a pulse width. And you can also look at the sequence context in which the polymerase is copying that region. It's almost like if you're driving a car and then there's an obstacle in front of you, before you come into the obstacle, you will slow down the car. When you go through the obstacle, you will navigate around it. And then after that, you speed away. So in other words, even without seeing the obstacle myself, just from your trajectory and your speed, et cetera, I can deduce that there is an obstacle there. So this is what we're trying to do. So by looking at the kinetics of the uh, polymerase, we can actually try to deduce the epigenetic status. And I call this a holistic kinetic model or an HK model. Now, for example, when you have the DNA molecule which is being sequenced, and this uh, CG, this cytosine, is the one in which I want to determine the uh, methylation status, I will basically look at the sequence context and also take down all of those kinetic parameters in this table. And because the DNA is double-stranded, the polymerase will also go to the other strand and do the same thing. And then I also copy the table. And then I can combine the two tables together at the bottom. And of course, this table looks to me to be a two-dimensional structure. And now I was wondering, is it possible we can analyze this two-dimensional structure with some of the machine learning methods which we're using to analyze the pictures? So for example, like the convolutional neural network or CNN for short. So we train a CNN and then we validate that. And interesting, when we do that, we actually find this HK model to be able to deduce the methylation status. So the, the one from HK model is a Y axis and the gold standard from Biselfi sequencing is on the X axis. And we're putting in different tissues and see there's a very strong correlation in the methylation level. The correlation coefficient is 0.99. And when you do a deep dive into each of those tissues, we have, for example, the puffy coat, we have placenta, or we have a liver cancer cell line. And then for each of those circles plot, the inner uh, circle is the HK model result, and the outer circle is the B cell phase sequencing. And the color is the methylation level deduced or measured. And see, basically, the HK model correlates with the bisulfide sequencing extremely well from all the genomic regions. And see the correlation coefficient range from 0.85 all the way to 0.98. And this work was just published about a year ago. And then also because we can then use this technology to detect the super long DNA in plasma and then look at the epigenetic profile. And of course the longer is that profile, it is almost like you have a longer barcode. We allow you to differentiate different tissues. So by using this technology, we find that if you have a long fragment of above 600 base pair, just by using epigenetic profile, you're able to determine the tissue of origin with an area under a curve of 0 0.91. But whereas in the old days, if you look at cell-free DNA molecules of less than 200 base pair, the accuracy is only 0 0.74. So we wonder now if we have those very long sets of redundant molecules with a lot of information, maybe we can use it to do some non-invasive prenatal testing of single gene diseases. Now the previous gold standard of this area was a technology we invented back in 2010 called relative haplotype dosage analysis. 
it was very accurate. But the problem with this sort of technology is is requires a lot of reads. For example, if you use this relative Hubble type dosage analysis, I call Riddle, RHDO, you need hundreds of millions of reads to reach saturation of a whole genome. But now, by using a super long salivary DNA, uh, which is plotted in red, you, said you can able to saturate your genome with just much fewer molecules. And this work was just published during Christmas last year. Now, so now we've shown that in pregnancy, there are some super long salivary DNA. But of course, the situation of a baby growing inside mother is somehow analogous to that of a tumor growing in a cancer patient. So we also wonder what we've talked about can also be applied to the cancer area. So we actually look at some liver cancer patient using Illumina sequencing and also PEC bio sequencing. And once again, we can see this previously unknown populations of cell-free, uh, long cell-free DNA. And furthermore, you can see that even the super long molecules, let's say here about 3,000 uh, base pair, also contains a cancer associated mutation. And also by using these uh, long molecules, I can also use epigenetics as a parameter to determine if a particular molecule is coming from a tumor. Now, so we think that this development is interesting because almost like for the last 25 years, in this cell free liquid biopsy field, we're looking at short messages from the baby and from the cancer. So each message is maybe 10 words or 20 words. But now with the discovery of the long cell free DNA, for the first time we can see a whole word document sent to us by the baby or the cancer. So we think that this long cell free DNA diagnostic coupled with this direct methylation analysis will allow us to see details which are invisible before. So I think in the coming years, we should have many interesting research and diagnostic potentials. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that plasma nucleoxid represent a treasure trove for molecular diagnostics. And today we talk about this emerging field called fragmentomics, and fragment size is one of the first fragmentomics marker. We also talk about this super long cell-free DNA diagnostics and this direct methylation analysis. So finally, I'd like to thank individual for my growth for generating data, which I present to you today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Lowe, for, uh, for your accessor Gao Qiang to the stage to deliver his speech. Professor Gao is a dis distinguished professor of Changjiang Scholar Program and chief physician in Zhongshan Hospital of Fudan University. The topic of the uh, speech he is going to share is uh, multi-omics characterization of liver cancer, clinical and translational implications. Let's welcome. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to here to introduce our recent multi-omic translational study on liver cancer. Uh, I'm a doctor from Zhongshan Hospital of Fudan University. Uh, the previous uh, speakers all have their own omic uh, techniques. They create uh, omics, but we doctors just uh, use this omic technique uh, to implicate for the precision oncology. Uh, I am a hepatobiliary uh, surgeon, so my major is uh, liver cancer. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, about liver cancer. The liver cancer uh, is very prevalent uh, around the world, and especially in China. Uh, about uh, half of the world case occurred in China. Uh, but we are very uh, disappointed with the treatment. Uh, as you see in the slides, it's very uh, hard to treat. And the five-year survival rate is about 14%, uh, uh, nearly the deadliest cancer just uh, uh, after pancreatic cancer. There are two kinds of uh, liver cancer. One is hepatocellular carcinoma, the other is uh, intrahepatic cholangio carcinoma. Uh, as we know, the HCC, the incidence is steadily uh, go down, and the uh, cholangio carcinoma, the incidence is growing faster. So our major work uh, is about the two types of liver cancer. 
Um, about the, the multi-omics, uh, we should acknowledge the genomics that are led by TCGA, uh, in which both the hepatocellular carcinoma and the cholangial carcinoma was uh, characterized. Uh, as you can see from these slides, we are now know the driver mutation and uh, all the passenger mutations occurred in liver cancer. Uh, from the other omics, transomics, uh, there are also very uh, rise studies about the clinical tran translational studies. Uh, they want to give some subtyping and the precisional treatment. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, liver cancer is very complex, unlike the lung cancer uh, and uh, other cancers that use uh, biome guided therapies. But the liver cancer is no accepted genomic or trans chromic biomics that are clinically uh, used. Uh, this slide has uh, repeatedly been displayed in this meeting. Uh, as we all know, single omics have their own limitations, uh, and multi-omics maybe uh, give a comprehensive insight into the disease pathogenesis. Uh, the right uh, picture I was copied from man, Dr. Man by at the yesterday's evening meeting, uh, we can see there are two copies of DNA, but the proteins and the PTMs are vast majority of the events in the cellular phenotypes. And also, from genomics to uh, disease phenotypes, uh, there are also must, other omics that must be uh, extensively selected. Uh, but our uh, major interest was the proteomics and uh, uh, phosphoproteomics. Uh, this strategy has also been uh, initiated by the NCI as a part of cancer moonshot. Uh, they call this uh, protein genomics. Uh, the protein genomics study has uh, given some deep insight into the previous char characterized uh, uh, cancers like uh, uh, colorectal ovary and breast cancer. And uh, as uh, as the omics, uh, the protein genomics have also have the potential for disease uh, precisional treatment. So, uh, in partnership with the CPTEC, uh, we have conducted the liver cancer protein genomic study. One is uh, HBV positive hepatocellular carcinoma, and the other is. Uh, intrahepatilla carcinoma. Uh, first, I will introduce our uh, HCC study. In this study, we uh, enrolled 159 HBV HCC patients. Uh, our main aim is to uh, identify some clinically useful multi omic signatures and disease pathogenesis. So, first, on genomic level, we can see that the HBV related HCC. Uh, has distinct mutational profiles with the uh, HCV related uh, uh, HCC as it reported in the TCGS study by Western samples. Uh, especially in the Chinese HBV related samples, uh, we found a Chinese traditional medicine related mutational signature that is associated with acid, AA signatures. And by uh, multi omic uh, trans. National studies, we found that these AA signatures are uh, associated with high tumor mutation burden, high tumor new antigen burden, increased uh, cytotoxic infiltration, and may be beneficial uh, from immune checkpoint treatment. Uh, this is very like the smoking lung cancer. As we all know, the smoking lung cancer is uh, maybe more sensitive than the non smoking lung cancer. Uh, so, uh, the bad side of the AS signature may open a treatment window for this patient. Uh, at the proteomic, uh, we found that a uh, great change of liver specific uh, proteins and functions. Uh, at the uh, HPA website, we know that there are about 400 uh, liver specific proteins. The mass majority of them was downregulated during hepatocarcinogenesis. 
uh, but we also notice some elevated liver specific proteins and functions are during hepatocarcinogenesis. This may be uh, provide some additional pathogenesis. Based on this pro genetic uh, characterization, uh, we provided a normal HUCC subtyping, uh, mainly the metabolism, microenvironment, and the proliferation uh, subtype. The three subtypes differ significantly in uh, prognosis, and we also validated the result in the TCGA database. From the uh, multi-omic uh, level, we can find that the signaling and the metabolic alteration in HCC. Uh, as we for look from this uh, slide, we can see that the cell cycle pathway was uh, changed uniformly at uh, all the omics level, but the other uh, signaling uh, for example, the TGF beta signaling uh, was not uniformly uh, downregulated or upregulated. This may question uh, some molecular target therapy at a single uh, pathway level. This may be uh, this this pathway may be uh, downregulated at this level and uh, upregulated at the other level. So it's not not be efficiency. Uh, this multi-omics also provides some disease pathogenesis. Uh, we especially look at the beta catenin mutated HCC. Uh, we all know the beta catenin mutated HCC is not uh, sensitive to PD-1 therapy. Uh, at this transomic study, we found the beta catenin mutation may lead to uh, glycosis upregulation through the phosphorylation or LDOA. The another study is about uh, the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, this kind of liver cancer is have a rising in the incidence uh, around the world. So we enrolled uh, more than 200 cases in this study. I, our aim is uh, the same as the study in the HCC, but we get more uh, implications our first is the disease subtype. We get four subtypes based on the multi-omic study. This four subtype is uh, closely related to the pathogenesis of intrahepatic cholangiocytoma, and they had a distinct clinical and the pathway features as well as a prognosis. Uh, from the treatment point of view, uh, we can see the driver mutations and the immune features of these four type, subtypes are highly distinct. Uh, as we look for the immune checkpoint, that is uh, very closely related to the current treatment. The four subtypes have distinct uh, signatures of enrichment of different uh, uh, immune checkpoints. We also found some rare case that is of interest and implies distinct disease uh, pathogenesis. As these four, 10 cases, we found a double mutation in uh, Keras and uh, TP53. Uh, these 10 cases have distinct uh, signaling networks uh, as analysis by transomic uh, uh, analysis. And there is an interesting uh, target that is clouding 18. This target is uh, on extensive studies by CAR-T, ADC, and uh, antibody treatment therapy. And it implies that this kind of uh, patients may be benefited from this therapy. And also, we found uh, another very interesting uh, genetic alterations in cholangiocarcinoma is FGR2 fusion. Uh, this fusion has its own uh, molecular inhibitors, but not all patients respond to them. Uh, we found that there is another alternative uh, treatment target that is the activation of PTP11. Uh, this target is also on extensive uh, clinical or preclinical investigations uh, in multiple trials. But uh, we also looked at the antigenicity for these fusions because it's a new protein for the host immune system. And we've proved that uh, some new peptide derived this fusion protein may generate 
uh, new antigens for uh, strong immune therapy may be used for vaccination or TCRT therapy. But uh, at another independent work, we found that this figuring protein uh, may lead to acute immune microenvironment. So uh, the immune therapy for this kind of uh, figuring cancer uh, may need a combination to activate the local immune microenvironment. Uh, the HCC, ICC, and uh, liver cancer is uh, a complex for disease etiology. Uh, here I would introduce some uh, other studies. They all use multi-omics to characterize the liver cancer. Uh, this solely proteomic study uh, published in Nature uh, focus on the early liver stage cancer. And this uh, combined HCC and ICC uh, use the transgenomic and the transcriptomic as well as single serial sequence to identify the mono and multi-clonal origin of the complex liver cancer and found additional four subtypes that separate HCC and ICC. Uh, and also, uh, the rising incidence of NASH associated HCC also attracted great attention. Uh, this study used the WS and the microarray based transformers to characterize the NASH associated HCC, and they found that the NASH associated HCC also has a distinct uh, mutation profile and uh, immune and metabolic profiles uh, from other etiology. As we all know nowadays, the NASH HCC is not sensitive to monotherapy or PD-1. This may be, uh, provide some uh, rational uh, found for these clinical observations. Uh, and they are also attempted to give some metabolic subtyping. Uh, this study just used uh, transcriptomic data uh, to simultaneously metabolic, not uh, uh, true sub metabolic subtyping. Uh, there is also some microenvironment uh, uh, subtyping using multi-omics, uh, including one that is from ours, that we found the ICC cholangiocarcinoma have three distinct uh, immune subtypes. Uh, the previous multi-omic uh, translational studies uh, only provide uh, possibilities, and we want to uh, give some real uh, clinical guidance. So we used uh, uh, primary liver cancer patient derived organoids and performed multi-omic study, including uh, proteomics and phosphoproteomics to characterize the drug response. And we do found that the organoid uh, can recapitulate the molecular subtype of patient samples. Uh, in previous cell line studies, the multi-omic uh, profile only found uh, the cell lines can uh, get one subtype from the patient, but the organoid can re, uh, capture at least three subtypes from patients. And we also found uh, the drug response from multi-omics uh, is uh, more accurate and precise than single-omic studies. And we have uh, confirmed one of the studies uh, in the molecular targeted resistant patient uh, we showed that the multi-omic identified combination therapy uh, can be used to uh, improve patient treatment using the xenograft and the PDX models. Uh, in the future, uh, we want to use uh, more sophisticated uh, omics, especially the special and the temporal omics studies to characterize the liver cancer uh, during the treatment process. Uh, thank you, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Gao, for his uh, excellent speech. Uh, next, let's connect with our final keynote uh, speaker, Professor Jeremy Nicholson. Professor Nicholson is a fellow of Academy of Medical Sciences and Albert Einstein Honorary Professor of Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, he is a pro vice chancellor for health sciences at Murdoch University. 
The topic he's going to share is multimodal metabolic phenotyping of COVID-19 and prognostic biomarker discovery. Let's welcome Professor Nicholson. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here to be part of this very distinguished gathering. Um, what I want to tell you about very briefly is what we've been doing in the last three years since we set up our laboratory in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, that is a, a, a one of the highest you know, value topics at the moment in biomedicine, which is understanding COVID-19 and its long-term effects. And that's what we've been basically working on. Uh, however, the laboratory was not set up to do that. In fact, it opened just about three months before the COVID pandemic actually started. So we built this laboratory, um, cost about $50 million, and it has a load of high end of technology for studying metabolism, metabolic phenotypes, proteins, and all sorts of different biological molecules. Um, I've spent most of my life actually at Imperial College London. We built a, a similar phenome center there back in 2012. And as part of an operation of building a, a series of phenome centers around the world, one way or another, I ended up in Australia, and it's not a bad place to live. Um, what we really set up to do is to understand gene environment interactions and how they underpin disease risks. So how do your genes and environment work to give you a high risk for, say, cancer or stroke or whatever it happens to be? And from environment, I mean all of the different things that affect our lives, the food that we eat, the drugs we take, the contaminants we're exposed to, and and actually basically our lifestyle. And there's a continuous stream of interactions between genes and environment throughout our whole life. Um, and of course, there are moderators on that as well. So one of the most important ones we've discovered in the last 15 or 20 years is that the microbes that sit within us and line our, all our epithelial cavities and are on top of us are actually the main interface between genes and environment. And therefore, the microbiomes have huge influences on outcomes of those sorts of interactions. And the emergent properties that come out of the gene environment interactions are what we call phenomic properties. So a phenome is something that originates uh, as a result of those interactions. And it can be measured in multiple different ways. It's not just metabolic, but it can also be measured physically. Uh, and Professor Lee Jin mentioned a whole series of different phenotypic properties that can be measured together to represent those gene environment interactions. The important thing is that metabolic phenotypes are actually quite easy to measure in comparison with a number of the others, and they also turn out to be relatively cheap to do. So from the point of view of, of translation and translation into a clinical environment, they become very attractive to study. And the other thing is that they're part of a continuum. Um, Professor Jin was talking about uh, lots of different thousands of different types of phenotypes, but they're part of a continuum and they're plastic. So the gene environment interactions modify the phenotype in real time. And the real question is, can we predict the outcomes of those interactions in terms of human health? Uh, and can we also modify them uh, for uh, disease prevention? The lab we set up is very sophisticated. Uh, it has uh, about 14 NMR spectrometers of various shapes and sizes. Uh, and about 30 mass spectrometers, uh, including the most powerful mass spectrometer in Australia and also the most powerful NMR machine in Australia. Uh, cost about, as I said, $50 million to put this lab together. Uh, so as the Australians say, we better not stuff it up. We better do, do a good job of making our laboratory work to tackle important human problems. Um, soon after the lab was officially opened, we had COVID and uh, we came on the news and I, I knew this was going to be important. So we dedicated quite a lot of the research efforts over the last uh, three years now uh, to COVID-19 uh, biology. And we have currently about 55 people in the team working on that. Um, of course, we can use all these different technologies in lots of different ways. Just thinking about it more, more generically, we can look at patient groups and we can look at at-risk population groups. So in the case of populations, we're looking for signatures that predict future outcomes. So population phenomics is like a metabolome-wide association study, which is the metabolic equivalent to a genome-wide association study. And in the clinical environment, we're interested in biomarkers and molecular changes that can give us new diagnostics and new prognostics for predicting the future. Um, you can also think of the patient journey from admission, say, for the start of a disease through to the recovery uh, from a disease process. 
uh, has been something that can be readily phenotyped through time. So longitudinal phenotyping and metabolism are actually really lend themselves to understanding patient journeys and does a drug have a good effect or a bad effect uh, in real time. So the way we do this or conceptualize this, the patient comes into a hospital environment, say they had pre-interventional diagnostics, um, and then a, a decision is made for what the intervention is going to be, and then there's an outcome. And we put techno all these different technologies along the patient journey to try and monitor the real-time effects uh, of the disease and the therapies. And this also lends itself, actually, to looking at clinical trials with a what we call a phenotypically augmented clinical trial, where we can actually measure the real-time metabolic changes caused uh, by an intervention. Uh, in addition to all of the technology, we have lots of different studies that are going on at the same time. There's lots of different technologies, there's lots of different studies, and lots of different statistics that we have to apply. So we run the laboratory in parallel. Our, our large number of spectrometers allow us to run hundreds of thousands of samples a year and assays. Each uh, sample assay may have a, having thousands of different metabolites in. But at the end, you have to spit, mix, it, mix it all together and cross-load and cross-interpret the different types of omics science. So the informatics process here is hugely complex. Um, we also have a Phenome Centre network, um, and in fact the ori origins of the Australian Phenome Centre was in the International Phenome Centre network, which we created back in 2016. And here the idea is there are multiple phenome sensors all over the world with similar and overlap technologies, which allow us to study disease in our own locations, but also because of the commonality of the, of the uh, analytical technologies and the harmonization of the protocols, we can share data and cross-validate uh, models across the world. And this has turned out to be incredibly important when it comes to COVID-19, uh, because as you probably know, COVID-19 um, has affected Australia quite badly now, but not in the first year or two. It really didn't have a huge effect in Australia uh, because partly of, of the isolation, we could watch the rest of the world falling apart and modulate our activities according to that. Uh, and as a result of that, we have this beautiful laboratory set up, perfect for looking at COVID-19, but with actually no samples in the early few months. So we created through the network uh, a, a method of bringing together samples from all over the world and running them through our laboratory uh, facility. And I, I think we've got one of the largest and most diverse collections of, of uh, COVID-19 samples anywhere. So COVID-19, everybody has, has become a virologist over the last few years. Uh, so there's not much you, know, you probably don't know about it. And obviously most people think about it in terms of a lung disease, and that's the most important overt sign, certainly in the earlier forms of earlier variants of the disease. But more importantly, because of its complex interactions with the immune system, it creates a huge series of systemic problems. And all those things on the right hand side, almost every organ in the body is involved with COVID-19 development. And people ex uh, express different sub phenotypes with different combinations of subsets of organs that are affected in the disease process. Furthermore, this is the basis of long COVID as well. Long COVID is a systemic disease um, and it's the result of a perturbed immune system uh, in the, during, that occurs during the acute phase. Um, and post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, long COVID is the common name for it, but PAX is the one that we use, uh, is, uh, actually affects every organ in the body. And about 20% of people, we reckon, have long COVID for a very long time. And a very long time is at least a year. And some people will probably have it for the last rest of their lives. And given that over 600 million people have had COVID, we're talking about many, many tens, even potentially hundreds of millions of people will get long COVID in the fullness of time. So it becomes one of the most important um, biomedical uh, problems to study. We can think of it as being an evolving um, in, uh, inflammatory disease. This actually has some similarities with the thinking that Professor Lee Jin put forward about mapping out different phenotypes. If we think about the normal population, us, um, we're all different biologically, we're different biochemically, we're different genomically, we're different metagenomically, et cetera. And we also have different levels of subclinical disease. Some have almost none and others have got more. 
and we know that the level of subclinical disease is proportional to the degree of severity with COVID. So you can represent all those different types of normality space as different subdomains, which have got different metabolic, genomic, transcriptomic uh, signatures, et cetera. So where you are in this particular space when COVID hits determines how far you go into the acute COVID inflammatory space and how um, severely ill you become. And again, in the case of the, the COVID-19 inflammatory space, that's active COVID, uh, there are multiple subphenotypes. Now, in many diseases, you go, go become abnormal and then you go back to sort of normality relatively quickly. In the case of COVID, a significant proportion of people go through a secondary phenoconversion phase, as we call it, uh, where they change their biochemistry again as the virus is eliminated, but the immune system is still abnormal. And then you can get emergent new um, micro, um, you can get emergent new um, symptoms and features. And then when you go back to normal, whatever that means when you recover, one of the important points is that we think that you don't go back to where you started. So if you started over here, when you've been through the cycle, you come up somewhere else. And what that means is your long-term disease risks have actually changed statistically. So your likelihood of getting uh, heart disease or diabetes has changed. So this is a really important disease and it's going to be troubling us for a long, long time. Uh, the way we've approached it, we've collected samples from all over the world. Um, we, we're looking at the populations, normal background population studies. So we've got lots of epidemiological samples uh, that we're running in order to define what normality is or the recovery position for the disease. And then we're collecting samples from all over the world uh, where we've got patient journey phenotyping, patient journey samples, which we're running through our laboratory. And then we're statistically integrating everything with the published literature uh, in our informatics team. So we can not only compare our own data, but also we can compare with what other people are getting as well. Um, so we, in the laboratory, we have a whole series of different technologies, as I mentioned. And what basically they do is they open up all the different windows on metabolism so that we can have a comprehensive view on virtually every metabolic process in the body and also quite a lot of the different uh, proteins and immunologically relevant molecules as well. Um, our first paper, which was published in um, August 2020, uh, was on integrative metabolomics, integrative modelling of all the different uh, technologies that we had put together. And this was the first integrative paper, I believe, that was published on COVID-19. And what we can see is when we start throwing these things together, this is a, a called a, a partially squares discriminant eruption plot, where we've got the differences between the populations expressed on the x-axis and a multivariate model, model of their uh, significance plotted um, uh, on the y-axis. It's similar to a volcano plot, but it's actually, actually it's doing something. That's why we call it an eruption plot. Um, and it has multiple variables in that you can actually expand and interrogate. So people who've been active COVID-19 have all got elevated levels of all of these different compounds and combinations of molecules. So this is a acute phase reactive glycoprotein. This is the AP, uh, apolipoprotein B100A1 ratio, for instance, that is uh, LDL4 fraction triglyceride. So we can go through and we can pick out all of those things and how they relate to the the cytokines that are in there as well that we've measured in detail. And cu cutting all that complexity down, these are the main metabolic changes that occur in acute COVID-19. There's a hyperinflammatory response, there's loads of LDL changes, there's a huge change in the kynurenine to tryptophan pathway in general. There, there is, it's diabetogenic, so you often get increased glucose, which can be persistent. Um, you end up with increased VLDL, a whole range of different stuff. I'm going to concentrate on just one because there's not much time, and that's what the cardiovascular risk marker tells us. That's this ABA1, which is elevated here. Well, ABA1 has been known for at least 30 years to be relevant to cardiovascular disease uh, and in atherosclerosis uh, and also myocardial infarction. And guess what? My, amongst all the things that COVID causes, it causes new onset atherosclerosis, and that's something that should really worry us uh, all because it can occur even when you only have mild respiratory uh, infection or re respiratory symptoms. If you look at that from the point of view of this ratio, which we can we measure directly out of the NMR spectroscopy, by the way, and we look at some controls. These are some controls from Western Australia. These are some mild COVID patients for the same variables, ABA1 plasma ratio. 
Um, and these are patients who are not hospitalized. And you can see instantaneously they get COVID. They're put in for, into medium risk from the point of view of myocardial infarction. And during the course of their acute journey, they're actually at increased cardiovascular risk. And what happens when um, they've recovered, in many, many cases, if they're mildly affected, they go back to normal fairly quickly. Some people, however, are persistent. In the case, this is a group of patients from Cambridge University to control, and the samples from those patients at six months after discharge. And what you can see, this is a much larger number of patients, what you can see is that even six months after discharge, a lot of those patients are still at medium risk for cardiovascular disease. And it's been well established now by other groups, including some massive studies involving millions of people, people uh, millions of people, uh, that cardiovascular risk is changed uh, right across the world. So it's a serious long-term worry and a healthcare burden uh, for us all. Um, what's the underpinning of this? Well, it's interesting. We've done cytokine analysis. So this is the ABA1. The, or every single one of these has got a story associated with it. I'm just telling you one story. So this is the ABA1 ratio. If you look at the cytokines, right, this uh, CCL5 is very strongly correlated with that. And you ask the question, well, where does that come from? Um, and the answer is, well, it's actually a, a chemokine, which is chemotactic T cells, um, and it reduces proliferation of the natural killer cells. And it's also, importantly, a viral suppressive factor that's released from the CD8 plus T cells. And on the same samples that we've actually done all this work, we did the detailed immunology with Cambridge, and you see exactly that effect. So one of the critical early effects of, of the, uh, the COVID infection is you get a bystander CD8 plus T cell uh, reaction, which basically destroys the, the, the cells that are uh, uh, infected with the virus. And therefore, those people have very uh, mild respiratory symptoms. However, the interesting paradox there is that very reaction sets off a cytokine chain, which is changing the cardiovascular risk of those people that actually don't have uh, poor, uh, such severe effects and uh, may be contributing to some of their long COVID conditions. So the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away here, protects you against severe respiratory, but opens you potentially to other immunological problems later on. Also, immunology works in complex ways on multiple systems at the same time. It has a long reach, as we say. And there are also major influences on the kynurinine and uh, tryptophan pathway. And just simplifying that right down, things in blue here are things that are reduced in COVID-19, and things that are red go up. Um, and things like quinolinic acid, really nasty, is actually used as, a, uh, as an experimental compound for producing striatal neurotoxicity and is used as a model for creating uh, um, Parkinson's disease in rats. So that's really not a good thing to have in high quantities. And there's some recent studies just published in the last few weeks that are now identifying potential cut Parkinson's-like changes in long COVID patients, which is almost certainly related to that pathway. And you can see this pathway is kicked off by these inflammatory cytokines, which uh, stimulate the indole dioxygenized enzymes, which start this pathway going. So as soon as we can trace something down a pathway, we can actually think about enzymes that are involved and potentially drugging those different enzymes. So this opens our way to therapeutic interventions. The other things that share abnormalities of this uh, pathway are all horrible. HIV, dementia, Tourette's syndrome, tic disorders, psychiatric disorders, et cetera. Uh, and so having disorders in this pathway in its own right is, a very bad, is very bad news. One of the diseases that's closest overall in terms of its, its phenotype um, to um, COVID-19 is actually um, systemic lupus erythematosus, which has multi-organ involvement, liver, brain, gut problems, skin lesions, and extreme long-term fatigue, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is a common effect of long COVID. And indeed, the cytokine connections and uh, the kynurinine uh, tryptophan pathway is, is actually well established also as being connected to atherosclerosis. So the immunological effects are driving the atherosclerosis from two independent means, one through the apolipoprotein transport of lipids into blood vessel walls, and the other through the kynurinine tryptophan pathway. Now, when we're thinking about um, conversion, we call it phenoconversion, when you move from one metabolic state to another. And that occurs when you're getting COVID-19. You get into a very peculiar phenotype, 
where you have multiple disorders from multiple pathways in multiple organ systems. So when you recover, we call that phenoreversion. It's going back to normality. And we were able to show that you could map this metabolically and that indeed during the phenoconversion and phenoreversion stages, you ended up with new phenotypes emerging through time. So it's a very dynamic disease and one organ system can move to problems in another organ system in real time. One way of showing that, this is just a very simplified version uh, on a relatively small number of, of patients who are not hospitalized by the way, but they came back six months after they'd had COVID uh, that they were originally diagnosed with. Um, and this is just a way of showing two different mathematical models from the same blood biochemistry that gives you slightly different answers. So if we look at the, the green over here are healthy people, and that is a good, so in this diagram, that's a good place to be metabolically. The blue is the COVID space, and these are the biomarkers that move them over into the COVID space. This is from the amino acid uh, uh, modeling. And at six months, what happens is there's still a lot of very abnormal people, and only a few of them have come back to normal. So with respect to um, this particular area of biochemistry, we have a, a quantitative metric of functional recovery. With the same people, same plasma samples, but run through a different, this is done by mass spectrometry, this is done by NMR spectrometry, Doing, running by NMR spectroscopy, you get a slightly different answer. So there's more people appear to have recovered, but these are functionally abnormal. So COVID is complex, it's different at diseases, degrees of severity, there's different metabolic and phenotypic subtypes in the acute disease, there's different emergence of disease uh, of phenotypes in long COVID, and there's different recovery rates for all of those in the, uh, in the longer term recovery process. Now, we've taken a lot of the, we work with Brooker for both mass spectrometry and NMR spectroscopy. They're our uh, instrument partner. They build a lot of the machines that are in our laboratory. We're partnered with them. And we discovered a lot of these biomarkers for the different, um, uh, let's call it the different sub phenotypes of the disease. And we, because we're partnered with Brooker, we've actually also partnered with the development of those as diagnostic tools. And just back in July, Brooker released an NMR based testing system, which uh, uh, basically benefited from the research discoveries in our laboratory and this is now a commercially available package that you can get so from discovery to a commercial package that could be used in a clinical laboratory um, in less than two years is really quite remarkable uh, in in many ways latest news and where we're going next is the idea of characteristic characterization of recovery and prediction of recovery in individual patients um, this paper was actually accepted today in nature immunology and combines our metabolic work with the immunology work um, of uh, cambridge university now i'm not going to go through all the detail because there isn't time uh, but the idea of being able to predict from an early sample where a patient is going to be uh, down the line is really important because we can try and predict who is going to get long COVID um, and won't get it severely and potentially even which subphenotype it's going, the patient's going to get. And that means we can start thinking about early interventions, not just to get them through the, the acute phase of the disease, but also to help their long term recovery, which is relevant to millions and millions of people. And the ideas were originated on prediction of the future based on metabolic profiles. We've, we've had going for many years, this back to 2006, where we're using metabolic profiles to predict um, toxicological outcomes or even efficacy outcomes of drug interventions. And the same principles actually apply for prediction of long term effects of COVID as well. So this is actually available online now. It's a, I'm, I decided not to risk putting a, doing an online demo in a short talk because those things always fail dismally. Um, but this allows you to play around with the data that we have. It's all publicly available. Um, and this includes messing around and, and changing the different levels of the, the cell types uh, based on the mathematical model we've constructed and looking at outcomes for individual patients and also figuring out which are the most important parameters out of all the immunological and lipoproteomic and metabolic that we can measure look at the most important parameters that we will actually want to measure for real patients in the future when they're on their re journey home from long COVID. And so we can actually plot, for instance, um, uh, predicted re um, areas on the recovery scores 
uh, based on the different sorts of data sets. And you can look at the relative contribution of the different, let's call it omics type scores in there. We have transcript omics data as well on this, by the way. What's really rather interesting out of all the fancy immunolo immunology that was done at Cambridge, which I can tell you cost a fortune to do, 40 different cell types measured quantitatively in about 1,000 patients. Um, um, in fact, um, the, all the information you need for the prediction of the outcome can be done in an NMR experiment, which takes about five minutes. So that's slightly embarrassing. However, uh, at least the immunology just tell us why it's actually happening. So it's interesting that when you're studying mechanism, you want to know a lot about the omics space. You want as many omics measurements as possible so you can fully build the systems biology picture of the disease and understand it. When you're wanting diagnostics and prognostics, you want the five or six simplest and cheapest things to measure that will give you the answer that the doctor and the clinician actually needs. And so, for instance, we can look at outcomes based on uh, good recovery and bad recovery and the different combinations of metabolites there. And here's a bad recovery one, uh, for instance. So at, the, at that end, let me just say, right, we're in the short time that our laboratories existed, it's already produced about 25 papers on COVID-19 and we do other things as well. Uh, and in going forward, the stuff we're going to be concentrating on is our long COVID program, which is looking at the cardiovascular effects, the diabetogenic effects, and also the neurological effects uh, and chronic fatigue syndrome relationships, which are really profound uh, with COVID-19. The other thing that's of great interest and importance and is re re relevant to long COVID is that COVID causes a systematic long-term shift in the microbiome. And that does not normalize very quickly from what we've seen so far. So one of the drivers of long COVID is the microbiome that's inside us, which has now got a disordered ecology and is sending all the wrong systems to our immune system. Uh, and and um, going forward, what we're really going to need to do is not only think of drugs to drug the pathways, but how we correct the ecology of our symbiotic uh, microbiome. And that's a real challenge for systems medicine and systems biology. So thank you to, for you to listening kindly. Uh, thank you to our close COVID team uh, for our COVID research program. Uh, and also thank you to our much broader uh, range of research collaborators around the world who are involved in all our many programs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Nicholson, for your excellent speech. Uh, th and uh, I, th I think I should thank you again for all the speakers' excellent speech. Next, let's uh, move on to the next uh, part. Uh, we are going to proceed our second part, the panel discussion which will last about 30 minutes. We will have 10 minutes in, in short. Uh, let's welcome Professor Jing Li, Professor Gao Qiang, Professor Liu uh, come to the stage, and also welcome our panelists online, Professor Marshall, Pro Professor Lo, Professor Nicholson, Professor Tian Qiang, and Professor Wang to join us. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the online connection to this uh, professors. Maybe we can start from the professors online first. Now we have four topics we are going to talk about. The first one will, will be uh, integrate multi-omics in early screening, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of disorders for precision medicine. I think probably we can start from Professor Marshall. Professor Marshall, can you hear us? Uh, yes, um, that's interesting. Precision diagnostics and precision medicine is the way we have to go. I think in the 20th century, everybody and the governments were quite happy to say everyone's the same. We're going to give you the average treatment, which is cost effective, and uh, the, the guidelines went out according to this because it was quite difficult and expensive to do precision medicine. But in 20th century, uh, 21st century, I think uh, everybody wants to have personalized treatment. Um, I don't want to have the same average treatment as everybody else. Uh, I want the, a, bit of a, a bit of thought going into my treatment and uh, a personalized, uh, customized kind of treatment to know uh, that, that I'm getting the right uh, treatment. So therefore I have to have accurate diagnosis. I have to know whether I've got a viral or a bacterial pathogen since I'm in infectious diseases. 
And uh, similarly, if you're getting on to genomics, uh, we want to know if we have cancer, we want to know exactly what kind of cancer it is, what's the genomics of that tumour and uh, what technologies there are av available around the world. And by connecting up with the right networks, um, certainly this idea of um, medical tourism is going to take off and not necessarily everybody is going to have to travel somewhere to get... To get, try again? Excuse me, my watch is annoying me. Um, we don't expect everybody to have to travel themselves, but uh, certainly pieces of tumour and DNA, uh, extracted DNA can be uh, sent to different centres around the world and recommendations come back. So uh, I guess all this online uh, thought and collaboration is going to pay off. And ultimately this personalised therapy for you know, practically everything is going to be the rule and perhaps guided by things that happen on your smartphone, data collection, et cetera. So um, that's my opinion and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Cassie, Cathy uh, delivered an excellent uh, you know, uh, studies uh, from the, the Peking Union uh, College. Uh, I think probably you can talk about this for the Chinese side, what we should do and what we, we can do in the past years. And, in the, uh, and also please comment on the perspective on the future studies. Um, <clears throat> I think <laughs> the precision medicine is really a big goal. And, uh, you know, after we hear all the speakers, um, excellent keynotes, um, we already know that how complicated the human body is, right? And, and how complex the data we will get by all different type of omics. So, um, um, I think in China, we did um, have a lot of um, effort to put on to try to um, achieve this um, integration, uh, integrated uh, omics data to achieve the precision medicine. And for example, um, before I came to Palm to Peking Union Medical College Hospital, and I was in the Peking University Health Science Center, and we have a multi omics precision center, research center. And But I think uh, right now, we probably need to focus on different pieces to come out to the, you know, the final goal, because we are still have no standard uh, to set up, and, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy did a remarkable job for those phenotyping, and also um, Professor Marshall have a, a good, you know, sequencing for the genome. And uh, myself, it made me focus on the proteome, which is um, the major target of the drugs. So I think we do need to work on on each side of each pieces to make them together at the end. So right now, I think we are still. Um, at the, I don't want to say at the beginning, but at least at the early stage of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Cathy. Now we have a second uh, question. I would like to invite Professor Nicholson and Professor Jin Lee to talk about the multi-omics data integration, interpretation, and its application. Uh, Professor Nicholson, maybe you can take over to yes. comment uh, on that. Um, so there's obviously um, many thousands of things that can be measured. And the first thing to remember that is actually quite expensive. So in the real world, you actually can't measure everything that you'd want on real patients. So ultimately, what we're talking about is a discovery process. Uh, we're using integrated phenomics and genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, to understand the biology of disease. And understanding the biology of the disease is the basis of the into individual variation that we want to try and produce therapeutic interventions for. So the understanding variability is the first and most important thing that we have to do almost for, for any disease. Uh, I mean, there are, there are the, the, which disease you're interested in, of course, it, it determines the balance of the omics types variables that you want to measure and the practicality of that as well. Just going back to cancer for a second, I mean, one of the most important problems in, in cancer is heterogeneity of tumors as well. So it's not just a simple genotype, it's the distribu spatial distribution of genes in a tumor and how that 
tumor evolves as it moves around the body, as it meta metastasizes. So this is a very, very complex process. And you, the sort of technologies that you'd use for studying that are not at all the same that you would want to use for the man in the street, the cancer patient on the ward. Um, prior to coming out to Australia, I was the head of the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial for, for uh, uh, 10 years. Um, and I can tell you, we did loads of genomic research. We did metagenomic research. We did all sorts of stuff, but we hardly did anything, uh, any of those things for real patients, even in one of the best uh, equipped fa you know, faculties of medicine in the world. We did BRCA genes and things like that for breast cancer, et cetera. Um, but the discovery process that we're trying to do as scientists, what we have to do right from the beginning is say which of those pieces that we discover are going to be the ones that we're going to try and use in the future in the real world, because that's that's our real job is the clinical translation. That's enough from me. Yeah, thank you. Professor Jing, please come on. Yeah, I really appreciate the, the comment that Jeremy just made. And uh, we are dealing with a very complex system. And uh, dissection into the complex system has always been a challenge. So whatever we want to achieve, I think it probably could be put under a framework of classification and the reclassification. But uh, when we are dealing with the integration of the data, we approach it in a different ways. Scientists would probably would like to, uh, are more interested in the mechanism while, or the, the real etiology behind diseases. But a physician uh, probably would be more interested in using my classification or the clinician's classification, whether you can come up with a solution. And you have to realize this two different goals may not really come to the point that uh, hand to hand. They, because you have to realize the classification, whatever way you are working with from the ph physician's point of view or from the scientist's point of view, none of them are perfect. So in this case, you have to re I think we have to realize it's going to be a, a iterative process going back and forth and trying to uh, understand the etiology of the diseases and thereby based on which we probably could improve the better classification which could be applicable for uh, clinical diagnosis and treatment. So this is going to be the challenge. And when we are dealing with a complex system and the analysis or the cross-scale analysis is a technical challenge and it's going to take, really uh, take the effort of the scientists and the physicians from different disciplines to work together. So this is uh, the, my two cents on the question of, uh, on this problem. Thank you, Professor Jean. Uh, we have our distinguished guest in the, our, among our audience, uh, Professor Levitt. Yeah, do you want to comment on this topic? I have nothing to say other than I've been really blown away by the talks. It's been terrific to listen. A great session. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> professor, yeah, professor, maybe the, our audience maybe didn't recognize Professor Levitt is a uh, 2013 Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. So we have a special guest here. Now let's move on to the third one. Third question is novel technology based non-invasive multi-omics approaches in clinical oncology. I think I would like to invite Professor Lowe, Professor Lowe, Professor Liu and Professor Gao to comment on this topic. Professor Lowe, could you please take over to Give some comments first. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, my particular area basically is to use uh, circulating nuclear exits to try to work as an early detection system for a variety of cancer. 
Uh, so in the particular field now, I think if you use circling DNA, uh, one challenge is that for stage one cancer, the detection rate is still relatively low. You know, um, for example, numbers that we have seen uh, published or presented in conference would be around maybe a 25% to 30%. So, so I think one debate is that um, a list of numbers, is it worth doing? Uh, my own personal view is it's still worth doing because at least we have the potential to save that 25 to 30 percent of individual. Uh, the second issue is, of course, a detection does not necessarily translate into actual improvement in survival. So I think this underlined the need basically for large international collaborative uh, trials to try to test some of those systems to see whether early detection eventually will actually uh, translate to improve survival. Uh, and of course, uh, for some of the other uh, technology which was presented today, um, I find it um, extremely exciting. I think the, the um, uh, advances in proteomics has really uh, jumped leaps and bounds. And so I think that in the future, and those type of markers would be very useful to actually combine to look at nucleic-based markers to see whether the uh, uh, detection and diagnostic application would be further enhanced. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Lau. Uh, Professor Gao and Professor Liu. Uh, I think uh, liquid biopsy is uh, very uh, helpful to clinical uh, practice in the near future uh, because uh, uh, I have said that many uh, major progresses in this area. Uh, such as the study lead, lead by Professor Jing, uh, the liquid biopsy for simultaneously detect uh, three types of cancer. Uh, and we also uh, conducted some uh, like uh, researchers and many groups around the world, uh, such as the GRIO uh, and the Cancer Seeker. Uh, the project, uh, the aim at uh, pan cancer early education. Uh, by liquid biopsy, many uh, from the CFDA methylation. And then now they also uh, focus on the multi-omics uh, liquid biopsy biomarkers. Uh, and uh, the sample size is enlarged to uh, one billion. So, so, so I think uh, in the near future, uh, the liquid biopsy may be uh, very helpful go to clinical usage. Uh, for cancer early detection. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Li. Okay, um, really, really good question. So regarding the metabolomics discovery, um, one of the most challenging is still how to identify the metabolites. Just uh, I talk about with my seminar, the number of metabolites almost up to 100,000, no, more or less. So uh, majority is unknown. So if we want to use metabolites as a kind of biomarkers to support disease diagnosis, first things we should precisely identify which one is what. So that's still a big challenge. How to uh, overcome this challenge? In my opinion, we should bring the different scientists with, with the different advertised together. For example, we, we, should the, we need the help of a synthetic chemist. They can help us to synthesize some reference compound, allow us to identify the compounds. Or even we should work with the biologist, biochemist scientists, so they can help us to determine the potential functions. Another challenge is, I think, uh, why we learn well the disease diagnosis and classification. Just today, the seven distinguished speakers talk much about the disease classification, disease diagnosis. The core value is to treat disease accordingly. So if we want to treat disease, currently I think the medicine, drug, is still the better option. If we want to get new drugs, the most challenging thing is how to identify the new drug target. So I think in the future, in the coming 10 years, for phenomics, omics, all the technology transfer, the, the, the critical 
question is how to discover and validate the new drug target that allow the chemist to uh, design or synthesize or even produce the diverse uh, functional compound to promote the drug discovery and development like that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Liu. Uh, I saw Professor Tian Qian is here online. Could you please also comment on these questions? Uh, do you have some uh, suggestions? Uh, so I'm no expert on liquid biopsy, but uh, uh, I've been a witness uh, at the field of system biology and all the omics uh, technology evolve over the years. Uh, and I was the first postdoc at ISP, you know, since 2000. And after that, I was uh, affiliate faculty at University of Washington. And since 2019, I've been running the, uh, the technology platforms at the National Research Institute at the Regional Hospital. So I think I'm a really a fervent advocate for integrating as many omics technologies, including genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, just you name it, into clinical research. So in fact, uh, you know, recent review article, so on Nature Review Clinical Oncology, we laid out many of these technologies on, and how we can apply it at clinical settings in terms of biomarker discovery and clinical trial designs. So I would uh, not belabor the audience here. So people who are interested in those topics can, can go read the paper. So while both the academic and industry uh, 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 leaders you know, always emphasize the importance uh, to address the unmet medical needs. So what I thought that uh, there is uh, not enough emphasis on the importance of clinical diagnostics this is something that I came to much appreciation while serving as the uh, uh, platform CEO at the National Center for Translational Medicine at the Region Hospital. So we indeed spent about 1.2 billion RMB to build six major platforms, including very advanced uh, multi-omics platforms, NGS, uh, MassBack, so on and so forth. So even a high throughput drug screening facility. And we have applied them to both hematology and the solid tumor translational research. But when it comes to the routine clinical services, the utilities are very limited. So as a physician scientist by training, so I would argue that we should push as much as we can for clinical applications of this technology for the benefit of patients and clinical outcomes. So I agree very, very much with the, Dr. Jin Lee's uh, early comment that we really shall bring uh, all these interdisciplinary scientists, clinicians, technologists, bioinformaticians, and bio biopharmaceutical companies, as well as uh, government and regulatory agencies together to join force working together to bring the, all this advanced technology into clinic. Just like what Professor Dennis Law has done for the uh, NIPT testing, so now you know, it's uh, widely applied around the world. We hope that uh, you know, if we can do this, uh, uh, bring everybody together, we can really eventually uh, 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 realize the, 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 the aim of precision medicine. Yeah, thank you, Professor Tian. And, and we have the last question. I think this question opens to everybody. Uh, all our invited speakers should give us two or three sentences to comment on this as, as just a summary of this uh, the, uh, forum. So this question is multi-omics analysis with deep machine learning methods and a model for diseases, for example, diabetes, asthma, heart failure, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, hepatocellular carcinoma, lymphoma, melanoma, et cetera. So, so free, feel free to think about that. Comments for two to three sentences. Maybe we shall uh, start from the, our online panelist, uh, Professor Marshall. Could you please start from, from your end? Um, <clears throat> from all these discussions, it does seem to me that the, the immunology and the immune system uh, as it's being perturbed by infectious diseases or malignant diseases, uh, or if it's being evaded because of mutations, for example, and uh, development in tumors. So there needs to be a lot more uh, application of omics and everything else we can get hold of to study the immune system properly. And I think uh, if we know how it works and how it senses the environment and reacts, it, reacts to it, uh, then we would be able to develop smart strategies to you know, enhance it or weaken it, whatever the case may be. And so many of us have got something wrong, which is really overactive or underactive uh, immune system uh, 
being involved in a particular organ, uh, that this would be one of the major things to hope for in the next uh, 10, 20 years. Yeah, thank you so much. This is the first take home message. So we, we should write down and just think about the future direction. So next, uh, Professor uh, Nicholson. Uh, well, firstly, to agree with Barry, uh, so almost all uh, chronic diseases pretty much are immunological one way or another. And we know a, a lot of our basic immune uh, system is tuned by the microbiome. So again, fundamentally understanding the mechanisms of the microbiome host metabolic and immunological axes as a piece of pure fundamental science is critically important because it's going to turn out in the future if we're going to change our trajectories through life for good or bad uh, then that's going to be where we're going to have to focus on on putting a great deal of effort in um, all of these things require huge amounts of informatics so this question was about you know deep learning etc i mean that's just a, a modern name for stuff that we've been doing for a long time we're doing multivariate statistics on complex data sets for tens and tens of years 50 years probably um, one of the things I just say about artificial intelligence is that, you know, it can come up with some fantastic answers, but if you ask the wrong questions, it's basically artificial stupidity. So just think about that. But yep. the future is microbiome and, immuno and the immune system, in my view. Yeah, yeah thank you for the second take-home message. And next, Professor Lowe. Um, I agree with what uh, Barry and Jeremy has talked about. And of course, uh, Jeremy has uh, hit on a message that at the end of the day, uh, the scientist is where the intelligence lies and artificial intelligence is only a tool. But that said, I think from Rick Sound, from my uh, personal experience, we've using that to deduce the uh, epigenetic profile, suggests that it frequently can discern patterns which are obscure to us as humans. But I think that um, understanding the limitation and to use it judiciously, coupled with all many of the high throughput technologies and well-designed clinical cohorts, I'm actually uh, cautiously optimistic that in the next 10 or 20 years, uh, AI is going to help us to discover many new things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Liu. Uh, Kathy, could you please comment on that? On that? Yeah, because I involve a lot of um, bioinformatics and deep learning, machine learning, AI, uh, this type of tools. Um, my um, really like to focus on the data quality, because as my experience told me that um, if it's not like you have a very good um, data scientist, that's enough, or you have a very good algorithm, that's enough. That's not enough, basically. Mm -hmm. You have to know. Uh, what data you are going to train your AI algorithm or what kind, you know, what's the standard of your data are. And this is so critical because people use, usually would say garbage in, garbage out. That's the key point. So that's, that's the reason I have been spent many years to work on how to make the data usable or validatable or translatable. That's the, the most important. Part, I think. So for the AI, um, definitely AI will help us a lot in the future, but um, it's not the everything. So it's not an Iron Man or Superman. Um, you, can, you can see from the Dr. Watson's cases and you can tell why the AlphaGo become a winner. So the rules and the meaning of the data is really important. So the, the, the analysts, they need to know the meaning of your data. Are they protein, are they metabolism, and what's the biological or physiological meaning behind those? That's why when we do our um, marker screening, we have spent a lot of time more than years, you know, three years to screening out, you know, the our you know, integrated proteome, integrated omics data to screen out the true markers that can be validated. So you can see the um, the, the the company or the the drug, the, the first in class drug ADC that improved that. Why the data quality is so important. <laughs> Another yeah. take home message. Right. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have uh, Professor Tian, uh, Professor Tian Chiang, please give us some uh, uh, summary. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, I only have one word, standardization, <laughs> but I mean, we elaborate a little bit. So, I mean, they have so many uh, different data types, so many different platforms, so many different type, uh, teams. So eventually you want to cross compare all this data be being generated, all the different algorithms, all the computation programs. How do you compare that? I think uh, early on in, in Dr. Jin Li's talk, you see that the International Human Phenome Institute have produced this uh, Chinese quartet standardized uh, materials, including DNAs, RNAs, proteins, metabolites. And they are distributing this standard material around the world. Right now, I think uh, we are going to work with the, uh, uh, the Phenome Institute, the Translational Center, and also the, uh, some of the uh, uh, abroad institutions to make this available so that eventually the data generated can be cross compared. So let's go back to the word standardization is really key. Yes, great. Thank you. This is a long sentence, one sentence. <laughs> so on stage, we will start from Professor Li, Professor Gao, and will be concluded by Professor Jing. So please. Uh, okay, so what we can, uh, what we can know for you and learn more? I think artificial intelligence data. So at this moment, I can say, at least in my group, uh, in the coming years, we will introduce artificial intelligence technology to our uh, functional metabolomic strategy to improve the performance of our storm and storm plus strategy, enable them to do more discovery things on the innovation of medical niches. Another I want to say, uh, actually we know the disease development always increase the different layer molecules work together. So that means we should can integrate the different level of this data together to tell one story. But currently we, we can't do that. So I hopefully the bioinformatics can work hard further to improve the performance of uh, artificial intelligence towards the integration of this data in biomedical niche. Thank you. Great, thank you. Professor Gao. Uh, artificial intelligence, there is a saying, only artificial, no intelligence. For biomedical, for biomedicine, uh, the deep mind has broken this uh, saying, uh, the deep mind, uh, deep mind, as you know, can precisely predict uh, protein structures for various uh, tumbling like this. But for uh, clinical medicine, uh, I think there is a need to brook a set point, like uh, the immune checkpoint, to achieve the real clinical usage of the artificial intelligence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Professor Jing, you will be the summary for this comment. Yeah, for the goal of pre uh, precision medicine, uh, to achieve in the, uh, individualized medicine, we do need integration of motor omics data and the journey, the long journey just gets started. But for the future, I think from all the, the, uh, the, the comments from all the panelists, I realized that there are four things that probably we should do better. The first is we need to look into more phenotypes. The second, we need more tech, uh, better technologies. The third is we need to have better analytical tools, including uh, artificial intelligence, uh, as most of uh, quite few uh, panelists mentioned, or uh, in particular, trustworthy uh, artificial intelligence. So in this way, not only we could uh, achieve certain level of classification, but also could use the knowledge that we gain to look into the mechanism. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we need a better study designs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for Professor Jing's uh, summaries. This is excellent. I think this afternoon, the whole afternoon, we have already heard about this, uh, the topic on the multi-omics area, uh, what kind of uh, precision medicine technologies are uh, 
are uh, doing right now in the clinical research and also the basic research, also including chemistry. And we heard a lot of great comments and opinions on the potential of utilizing multi-omics methods to solving unmet clinical needs. Uh, we do really hope the breakthrough in these areas could bring us more benefits to the health and of mankind. I think, uh, thank you all uh, for your wonderful sharing and please stop here and we can, do we need to take another picture? No, okay. So uh, I think we should summarize today's uh, topic and uh, thank you so much for our invited speakers and also thank you for our staffs and audience. Thank you so much and see you next time. Thank you, bye-bye.